Episode 256, The Grave of Stabbing, 2. Crispy. The dried parchment, buried in salt, unfolded like it was crumbling. I saw a familiar handwriting inside it. Dear Brother C, with the concern of my younger brother Hugo. Vikir first checked the sender of the letter. As expected, the sender of the letter was Hugo Les Baskerville. It was understandable that the seal on the letter was only used for special military secrets that could only be handled by the head of the family. However, there was something strange. Older brother? And your younger brother? Hugo is clearly the eldest son and head of the Baskerville family. But was there anyone he could call his brother? It was something that was difficult to imagine, both inside and outside the family. At that time, something Hugo had said before suddenly appeared in Bakir's mind. It's okay to eat for free. He he he. That is correct. This father also worked hard to become the legitimate eldest son when he became the head of the family. It was part of a conversation we had a while back when we beat up the high bro, middle bro, and low bro triplets. When I first heard this, did I think being the eldest son could be considered hard work? I had a question. But now I understand better. Hugo was not the eldest son, but as a result of a fierce power struggle, he killed or defeated all of his older brothers and became the head of the family. In other words, he became the eldest son by birth. But? Hugo still humbly called himself a younger brother, but was there still someone left whom he could call an older brother? That is the question. If you think about it carefully, it's not like it's completely non-existent. Vikir read the entire contents of the letter while tracing his memories before returning. One of my fifteen-year-old sons has just returned from surviving alone in the Red and Black Mountain floods for two years. Therefore, we are planning to hold a small dinner, and if you have the opportunity, please attend and make the event shine. It's been a long time since I haven't seen you face to face. The return of my brother, who possesses the greatest power among the seven counts, will certainly be a great strength to the family in itself. Then I will wait for your reply. Roughly speaking, the message was that Vikir had survived the flood and should come to the banquet. Vikir looked at the letter and stroked his chin. The letter wasn't as old as I thought. And this is the first time Hugo has seen someone so formal. Now I can guess who the recipient of this letter should be. Brother C. And the seven counts. In the Iron Blood Swordsman Baskerville, there are seven counts who spend their time solely in battle. In the world, they are called Seven Counts. Seven Counts is a very old position and has existed since the Warring States period, before the founding of the Great Empire, when this continent was in disarray as if colorful jellies had been spilled on a map. At that time, the king was just a small castle lord, and the current empire has integrated them all into one empire and seven families. For example, the Iron Blooded Swordsman Baskerville manages the foreign barbarians and the wandering tribes of the sea are managed by the spearman Don Quixote. One family, one country. A time when one family was prosperous enough to function as a kingdom. A period of chaos when everything was gradually being integrated into one empire and seven families. This was actually the heyday of the seven count system. The seven counts were able to fight throughout the western front by mobilizing their family's military authority without the permission of the head of the family. The seven-headed carriage that led the golden age of the Baskervilles, when monsters, barbarians, and other families were all afraid of the teeth of the crazy fighting dog. However, after the empire unified the continent, the massive battlefield disappeared. There were always small local wars, but there was no chaos like before. It is chaos on such a massive scale that one old bloodline disappears and dozens of castles collapse in one day. As the era of military rulership came to an end, the prestige of the seven counts naturally decreased significantly. So sometimes the old Baskervilles in the Senate looked nostalgically about the past and reminisced about the seven counts of those days. Troubled times. The seven teeth of the sword that ran through the battlefield without anyone paying attention, that freedom, that romance. Their argument was that this was the true Count Chilbu. The current politicians who are only focused on political warfare do not deserve to be called the Seven Counts. Certainly, it was a time when the inaction and power of the Seven Counts was truly as strong as that of a family head. Vikir recalled something that had happened in the past. When Vikir returned to the Baskervilles after living with Balak, 
Hugo was very happy and held a large banquet. Those invited at that time were the current seven earls, the seven knight commanders who enjoyed the most powerful power after Gaju and Sagaju. It is said that they all wanted to take Fakir to their knighthood, and perhaps that was why they all wanted to attend the grand banquet, which they usually did not attend. Isabella, Les Baskerville, leader of the Doberman Knights. German, Les Baskerville, leader of the Shepherd Knights. Les Baskerville, Metzgerhund, leader of the Rottweiler Knights. C.U. Chulin, Les Baskerville, leader of the Wolfhound Knights. And the Boston Terrier Les Baskerville, leader of the Pitbull Knights, and the Great Dane Les Baskerville, leader of the Mastiff Knights. However, due to issues of distance and time, only two people who actually attended the banquet were Count Boston Terrier, leader of the Pitbull Knights, and Count Great Dane, leader of the Mastiff Knights. Later, I heard from Thindy Wendy that the number of seven counts who wanted to attend at that time was six. Yes. In fact, when Vikir returned from the Red and Black Mountain floods, there were six of the seven counts who wanted to attend the great banquet, not all of them. The reason is that one of the seven counts turned his back on the world and went into hiding. Although contact had been lost for a long time, he was the strongest and oldest of the seven counts. To find out his whereabouts, the Baskervilles sent numerous letters and messengers, but no reply came back. And even those who went to deliver letters. So there was a perception that the number of seven counts was actually six. Count Cheel said he had lost contact. It is he. Vikir was able to clearly identify the entity the letter was referring to. A being that Hugo calls, Brother C. He is the only one among the current seven counts whose name is listed among the old seven counts. Count Cheel, a true spirit of his time who went through the turbulent times of war. Even Hugo, who killed all of his older brothers and became the head of the family, was unable to do anything until the very end. It was, Cain Corso Les Baskervilles. Vikir was able to clearly see why the nameless pit bull that was delivering the letter died. Waiing. A terrible storm is engulfing the entire desert. The grains of white salt sand that twist along with the wind spread across like a huge castle wall, sweeping away and drying out everything. During the extremely dry season, everything it touches loses its moisture, becomes brittle, and is soon chipped away by sharp grains of sand. Vikir was walking through it, wrapped in a black cloak. It's definitely difficult. Graduator deserves to die. Even simply holding on is this difficult, but if a basilisk, a dangerous S-rank monster, attacks you, you will have no choice but to prepare for death. Even if you are a top-level graduate combat pro. Call. A large crow flies in the sky. They are targeting the corpse of Akir, who died after being caught in a storm. But not even the crow in the sky could escape the power of the salt storm. This huge bird of prey, which failed to calculate the distance, had its neck and wings broken by the force of the storm and soon began to be salted while floating in the air. Pow! Soon, the crow's desiccated mummy fell to the floor. His entire body was bent and crushed, but he had already died due to rapid dehydration. Um. If there was a basilisk, I wouldn't have been able to go in. Vikir muttered as he rode through the edge of the storm. He was barely able to survive with his body strengthened by the river sticks and the regenerative power of the monsters he had absorbed through Beelzebub. How much time has passed? As I came through the salt storm, I saw something strange in the middle of what had been a white sandy field. Tower. It's a dark red tower. It was a strange and strange building that could not be described in any other way. This tower, which looked like an awl sticking out of the ground, contained both the black color of the night sky and the red color of blood. The material of the cold metal that made up the wall could not be guessed, nor could its height be estimated. However, what was certain was that inside the tower in front of me, there was a high-dimensional space distortion magic that could not even be compared to the one in the magic tower. This actually existed. Vikir had certainly seen this tower before. I didn't see it with the naked eye, but it happened briefly during my childhood before my regression, during Yu Ah Song's liberal arts class when I had just escaped from the cradle of stabbings. A fictional being, a product of imagination, that always appeared on the pages of textbooks when studying the family myth of the Baskerville family. But it was here and now, standing tall and real. Eventually, Bakir arrived at the tower and discovered a phrase someone had crudely carved with a knife in front of the cave, which was presumed to be the entrance. 
Grave of stabbing. From cradle to grave. It clearly means someone's final road. Episode 257, The Grave of Stabbing, 3. From cradle to grave. The life of an iron-blooded swordsman hound consists only of sword needles. The true Baskerville is born in the cradle of stabs. Vikia quietly recited a fact that everyone in the world knew. However, the legend passed down within the family has a backstory. A true Baskerville dies in the grave of the stabs. It is a blurred text that remains only as a faded mark on a page of an old history book. An old myth that everyone thinks is just fiction. However, the moment he discovered this tomb of stings, Bakir had an intuition. Among the proverbs handed down in the Baskervilles, there is not a single lie. Literally from the cradle to the grave. The Baskerville road is made entirely of sword stabs. Bakir once again realized that this was the fate of the iron blood swordsman hound. Giapuk, Giapuk, Giapuk. Bakir walked up the steep stairs inside the tower. The stairs, each pointed like an awl, rose high. If you were an ordinary person, you probably wouldn't have even known that this was a staircase. If the inside of the magic tower was mysterious, beautiful, and dreamy, the inside of this tower was an extremely lonely, suffocating, and lonely space. Every time I take a step, I feel like my flesh is being cut off by the strangely shaped rocks and stalactites around me and the nameless rusty swords stuck here and there. Countless swords are glaring at us with their tips raised. If you were a prosecutor with a keen sense of energy, you could feel it even more closely to your skin. Stinging, countless stabs, sharp gazes. As I go up, my entire body feels like it is shrinking little by little. A staircase that is worn down, cut out, and chipped away, and can only be climbed by taking one step at a time. If Fakir had not been a sword master, he would have died as soon as he entered, let alone climbing the stairs of the tower. Eventually, Bakir reached the upper level of the tower. The sight of countless knives sticking out was reminiscent of a cradle of stabs, but a much more brutal and sharp energy filled the empty cavity. It must be because of the man sitting on the throne in the center of the cavity. An iron throne made up of sharp swords. And there was a man wearing thick iron armor and a long gray beard. Below the gray eyebrows, what should be the whites of the eyes are filled with empty darkness, and in the center, red eyes like the sun burn coldly. The nose was as sharp as a knife, the lips were tightly closed, and the dead, blue skin seemed to be so dry that it barely covered the skull. The black heavy armor and huge great sword he was wearing made the stronghold he was building look even more solid. Bakir immediately realized the identity of this old man. Cain Corso. Cain Corso Les Baskerville. Even Hugo, who killed all of his older brothers and became the head of the family, was unable to do anything until the very end. A being who reigns as the strongest among the former seven counts and the current seven counts who have experienced difficult times. The average level of inactivity for the seven counts is somewhere between the top level of graduator and the path to master, but this is absolutely not the case for the Kane Corso. Although Kane Corso was Hugo's older cousin, their ages were almost a generation apart. Even before he turned his back on the world and went into hiding, he was already stronger than Hugo, the sword master, and was literally the legend of the sword. Is that why? The Cain Corso did not show up at any family events, such as the great banquet or the household meeting, and refused all of the attendants and knights that a seven count would normally have with him. He did not intervene in anything in the world, and in his later years he erased all traces of himself and went into seclusion. Therefore, his actions remained only in literature, and the records were so unrealistic that even the direct descendants of the Baskervilles did not believe them at all. But. Even now, no one denies that the Cain Corso was the strongest swordsman of the Baskerville family. If my brother had been greedy for being the head of the family, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Even Hugo of the world would admit this. Meanwhile. It was here as expected. Vikir thought quietly to himself. Before Vikir returned, the Cain Corso did not appear in the world even though the era of destruction had arrived. However, something happened just once that made it possible to guess that he was not dead. One time, a large number of demons marched across the enemy and Black Mountains. The goal, of course, was to conquer the human world. However, after crossing the mountain range and gathering, 
I realized that some of the legions that were supposed to be gathered were not visible. The demons and the human alliance quickly tracked their location. And soon a surprising fact was revealed. It was true that countless, truly enormous, demons had died while crossing the Uni Salt Flats. Of course, it was a place where salt storms and basilisks existed, but it didn't make sense for several legions to be wiped out. So a demon trooper chase team was dispatched to investigate the scene. However, none of the demons that entered this salt flat came out alive. Every time they come here, they either go missing or are found as torn and dismembered corpses. Even that would only be discovered after it had been blown far away by a storm. So the human alliance forces concluded that there was something unknown, strong and dangerous in the salt flats. As a result of the great heroes of flying and crawling putting their heads together for a long time, it was determined that several absolute masters who had turned away from the world and lived in seclusion were the cause of the incident, and one of them was the Cain Corso. Seeing that one of the Baskerville's hounds died while trying to deliver a letter, Hugo must have already guessed that the Cain Corso was here. That's why Vakir also came here today. Hugo Les Baskerville, a sword master like himself and a master of the seven Baskervilles. And the Cain Corso, which is said to have surpassed Hugo a long time ago. Vakir meets Cain Corso and tries to find hints about Type 8 of Baskerville and a way to overcome the Sword Master. And on top of that, I also get a ghost tree. You can guess it by reading the book The Return of the Hound of the Sorcerer's Head. The Revenant tree grows right here. In addition, Vakir also knew that the Wraith tree was located in the Uni Salt Flats due to his knowledge before returning. This is because I personally saw the scene where Seer, the eighth city, was collecting the fruits of the revenant tree that had grown to the point where its branches extended all the way to the outside of the salt flats. At that time, a huge number of people were sacrificed to prevent the wraith tree from being taken over by demons. And, using the lives of those sacrificed as fertilizer, the ghost tree grew even bigger. Not only did it cover the entire desert, but it also grew bigger and taller than the entire Red and Black Mountains. It looked like a world tree that appears in mythology. It hung countless fruits beneath the bare branches that stretched out across the mountain. The skull-shaped flesh that hung deliciously was ripe and full of the flesh of corpses and the juice of ghosts, and the way they hung and swayed in the wind was like seeing corpses lined up with their necks hanging. The Fruit of the Revenant Tree Ghost Flesh when the devil picked the fruit and took a big bite, the thick mana of the sound dimension spurted out along with the blood-like juice, and at the same time, a scream full of pain resounded loudly. There is no way for the dead soldier, who was dying, to become completely refreshed by taking a bite of the ghost flesh. The wraith tree added tremendous power to the demonic legions, and at the same time became a disaster for the human union itself. Vikir ended his reminiscence. Sure enough, I can see something black behind the iron throne in front of me. A throne made up of countless swords. The evil intent that grew behind it. That's it. That is the revenant tree. It seemed like there was no other tree in the world other than me that could be called the ghost tree. A tree of ghosts that grows with the nourishment of the resentment, screams, and grief of the living. Skull-shaped flesh filled with the power of the dead. The sight of it growing steadily upward was so grotesque that even the cure of the world got goosebumps. It is still small, but as time goes by, it will cast a darker and more massive shadow than any other shadow cast in this world. Meanwhile, the cane corso raised his head. And he opened her mouth with a voice as heavy as lead. This is the grave of the stabbing. The final destination for those who pursue the ultimate purpose of the sword. Inside the eye socket, where the white and black eyes are reversed, the old man's red pupil has a young look. He seemed to be curious about Vakir's youthful face. Hey kid. What are you? The Cain Corso is much older than Hugo and is the eldest adult in the hierarchy, so strictly speaking, he becomes Vakir's uncle. But Vakir had no intention of respecting the family's laws or rules. Visor. That is why he can draw his sword without hesitation. Find out for yourself. The only thing I was interested in was the road to Baskerville Type 8 and the two ghost trees that were blooming behind the Iron Throne. Episode 258, The Grave of Stabbing, 4. Find out for yourself. Vikir increased the strength of his entire body. The demonic sword Beelzebub protruded long, 
and the aura rotating at high speed on its surface burned dark red. A solid material aura embodied in the air. That is the symbol of the sword master. The cane corso's eyes opened slightly. In a darkness filled with nothing but emptiness, a red-hot flame burns. Firewood is definitely a curiosity. Eventually, the old man on the iron throne stood up. When he got up, the already stuffy tomb of the stab wound seemed to become even more suffocating. The cane corso's mouth opened. The child doesn't have a very good personality. Who is your father? Question and answer dance. Bikir even raised the ghosts of monsters to the swordmaster's aura. Flash. Baskerville 4, Bakir went through two lives and presented his most confident season. Currently, Bakir can produce the maximum output of Type 7, but there is nothing better than Type 4 to swing the sword thoughtlessly. Since it requires almost no mana and the body's proficiency is over 100%, it can be said to be a cost-effective basic attack. Who? This level of skill. He still looks young. The cane corso dodged all of Vakir's attacks by simply tilting its head back slightly. It is clear that they are the Baskervilles, and whose descendants are they? Boston Terrier? Great Dane? No, they look very different. Hugo, is it really that kid? And, as expected, the cane corso also showed off the Baskerville formula for. Pack. Space breaks apart. The cane corso's black aura and Vakir's dark red aura clashed, tangling fiercely. Yep. Whoops. Qua geek. The atmosphere was breaking into pieces. Sharply broken pieces of air flew in all directions, creating a sharp wind. Bakir gritted his teeth and continued to swing Beelzebub. The cane corso's eyes widened once again as it saw Beelzebub emitting red light from Bakir's wrist. Is it Beelzebub, the magic sword that was put into action? In the past, even the outstanding twins Cain and Abel wasted three years and could not obtain them in the end. Ah, uh, how do you have that? But Bakir did not answer this. Pop. This is because before the cane corso's sword reached his neck, he put on the black mask that was tied behind his neck. Mask of human faces, picaresque slash mask. Brotherhood plus zero. Human mind susim, human face susim, on. Vikir, who instantly turned into a black dog, used his smaller body to avoid the cane corso's sword. At the same time, he jumped between his legs, took off his mask, returned to his human body, and swung his sword. What is this? The Cane Corso couldn't help but widen its eyes at Vikir's attack method that went beyond common sense. Dogfight. Completely practical. Not expecting or giving human dignity to the other person. It's a movement that feels like dealing with a monster. He he he, it's been a while since we had a fight like this. But surprisingly, the Cane Corso did not seem to dislike this type of melee. Wow. The Aura Blade flew towards the groin, but the cane corso blocked it with the handle of the great sword and soon threw Vakir away. I would be grateful if it would increase the distance. Even as Vakir was being thrown away, he reached out and retrieved the black cloak that had been hanging on the wall. There, the black palace Anubis was baring his teeth. Puff. The terrifying sniping rushed towards the cane corso in five orbits. Is it archery this time? This is my first time seeing a sword master who is so good at catching. The cane corso treated Balak's archery as just a trivial skill. Quagajik. The black aura he created formed a round sphere and crushed all arrows flying from all directions. At the same time. Quack. A cane corso that jumps with tremendous leaping power and swings a great sword. But he could not help but pause in the air for a moment. Countless invisible thread-like things were wrapped around the cane corso's body. Nucleus Nucleus. The baby madam riding on Vikir's shoulder can be seen making a triumphant expression. Good job. Vikir petted the cub once, then jumped up and leaped at the cane corso. A gap, this gap would be the only chance to take down the giant tree of the previous generation. If you defeat that guy, you may find the answer to move on to the next level. And it was also an opportunity to obtain the revenant tree. Flash. Eventually, the true value of the Baskerville Type 7 was revealed. 
The cane corso opened its eyes wide as it saw seven teeth clearly exposed before its eyes. Baskerville's seventh meal. Moreover, lurking ambush swordsmanship. How can this be so sad? Surprisingly, the cane corso recognized Vakir's sword skills. This was something that even Vakir had not expected. How does this old man know about the vision of the Baskervilles, which even Hugo cannot know because all the original swordsmanship textbooks have been destroyed? But there was no time for the question to be resolved. Vakir did not miss the gap created by the combination of the picaresque mask, Balak's archery, and Madame Young's wire trap. Qua 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 The seven teeth that could defeat even the devil ravaged the cane corso's entire body. Gotcha. For a moment, Vakir felt a sense of futility at the victory he had achieved so easily. But even for a moment. Vakir flinched for a moment due to the strange sensation of touching the tip of his teeth. After the fragments of aura, wind, and steam clear, I see what is in front of me. Surprisingly, the cane corso was fine without any injuries. All seven slashes made by Vakir were blocked by the heavy armor of unknown material worn by the cane corso. At the same time, Sigh. The cane corso's large grip grabbed Vakir's neck and tightened it. Heavy black gloves covered all of his fingers, and just like the tomb of the stabber, the material it was made of is unknown. Vakir tried to cut off the cane corso's arm, but failed because it was blocked by the thick and strong armor. Who would have thought there was something in the world that the sword master's aura couldn't cut? Soon, the cane corso looked down at Vakir curiously. To ascend to the realm of supremacy at an age that seems unreasonable. This is surprising. There is a noble person in the family. Vikir frowned. No matter what kind of armor the cane corso is wearing, it cannot be broken no matter how hard you try. There is nothing you can do about it as it covers your entire body from the neck down. At that time. The cane corso continued. But even in the supreme realm, there are classes. Vikir opened his eyes wide. Originally, when you reach this level, even a passing word from a higher being can be a huge boost to your heart. From the cane corso's muttering, Vikir got the hint he had been waiting for. The reckless challenge paid off. If there's a problem, is it, I might die right now? Soon, the cane corso pinned Vikir to the ground. Quack. Ujijijijik. In the meantime, Vikir turned his body in the air, placed his hands on the floor, and landed straight on. Although the skin on my palms was completely ripped off while I was being pushed back, I was able to prevent my neck and spine from being broken. The cane corso calmly opened his mouth. Just as experts and graduates are divided into upper, middle, and lower categories for convenience. Sword master can also make that distinction. Oh no. You are just a chick who has just entered the realm of supremacy. The cane corso smiled faintly. Your facial expression clearly shows what you are thinking. I had the same thoughts as you when I first entered this tower. Of course, I was much older than you at the time. Afterwards, he added very little. Perhaps. Maybe it's possible for you. If it's your age. I might be able to see the last page of, that book of swordsmanship. Vikir frowned at the incomprehensible words. Then the cane corso laughed. Bright enough to make you feel bad. Good night. If so, I'll show you. I guess I should give this much to the guy who will become the next generation's tower owner. At the same time, he muttered something unintelligible. Rumbling. Bubble bubble bubble. A black aura began to form all over my body. For a moment, Bakir had to fall from the chilling energy that was constricting his whole body. Drud. The entire tomb of the stabbing was shaking. At the same time, the instincts of a seasoned veteran are frantically warning. Get out of this place right now. Well. Soon, the cane corso's heavy greatsword rose upward. And. Flash. It fell straight toward the ground. A ray of black lightning. That single simple movement was soon split into several trajectories and rushed towards Vakir. And Vakir saw. Type 9. A lurking ambush, the ultimate of the Baskervilles who thought they were the only ones learning. 
This sword technique has nine teeth and is tearing the whole world apart. Episode 259, The Grave of Stabbing, 5. Lurking Ambush, the ultimate in Baskerville swordsmanship. This depicts nine teeth. What does this mean? Baskerville's old style. Just as there are highs, lows, and lows in the expert and graduate levels, if sword masters also have this kind of sharing if so, this is a sword technique that only a being at the advanced level of a sword master can cast. The nine teeth, each driving, holding, tearing, cutting, dismembering, cutting, crushing, mincing, and crushing, were devouring the entire world. It was more powerful and destructive than any other swordsmanship that exists in this world. It seemed impossible for the predator's murderous intent to cut beneath the skin more vividly than this. Even for Vakir, a veteran who had lived through the era of destruction, this was his first time experiencing it. There was a being in this world who could wield a sword like this, even among humans. Admiration as a swordsman and a seeker walking the same path. It was something that burst out purely, regardless of the divisions between blood and blood. But you can't just admire it. Even at this very moment, the Baskerville Type 9 cast by the Cane Corso was rushing towards us, splitting every moment into moments. In this imminent storm of blades, Bakir exploded with as much power as he could muster. Baskerville Type 7 After abandoning emotions and ascending to the sixth form, he reached the highest level with his emotions regained after going through many hardships. Bakir whipped out the tip of his sword and created seven teeth, which he used to counter the nine teeth in front of him. The Hound of the Iron Blood Swordsman fights against the monster with all its might. The result is. Quack. Usajijijik. Naturally, it was Vakir's defeat. It was only natural that Type 7 and Type 9 faced each other. Vakir felt his whole body being torn apart. The pain felt as if a piece of meat had been dropped into the mouth of a huge toothy monster. It was a level of damage that was impossible to withstand with the regenerative power of a bog salamander. At that time, Vakir grabbed hold of something at death's door. It was a survival instinct, a part of desperation that I had never felt since entering the supreme realm. When will a sword master experience this kind of experience? It is no exaggeration to say that there is no opportunity to experience being helpless in the face of great fear and violence. And paradoxically, when I realized that I was nothing, just an insignificant fly. Flash. A change occurred in Vakir's swordsmanship. Baskerville's eighth form, a stage that must be supported by a desperate desire to survive, a thirst for life, an extreme combat experience. When a person who has lost and regained his emotions becomes attached to life, the door to type eight opens. Vakir swung his sword and drew the eighth tooth. Although it was still small, it was a clear and distinct Type 8. At the same time, Types 9 and 8 clashed and cancelled each other out. And. Phew. A long tooth pulled out by the cane corso dug diagonally into Vakir's body. Quack. In the end, Vakir was thrown away helpless and buried on the outskirts of the Tomb of the Sword. Cane Corso. Sword Master advanced. No, superlative. An absolute being who has reached the level of Baskerville Type 9. He was quietly looking at the rising dust. And soon, a light flashed again in the Cane Corso's eye sockets, which had been filled with darkness. Giapuk, Giapuk, Giapuk. Vikia was walking out from below, where crumbling aura, sparks, and blade fragments were falling like snow. Tsutsutsutsu. The deep, almost amputating knife wound that ran diagonally across Vakir's body was healing at an astonishing rate. A regenerative power that surpassed that of humans long ago. It was a recovery speed so incredible that even high-ranking monsters that specialized in regenerative abilities could not compete with it. Is it a basilisk? The Cane Corso saw Vakir's abilities at a glance. Vakir stopped walking. Beelzebub, the binge-eating fly slash all. Minus one slot, deadly poison, madam eight legs, s. Minus two slot, firefly, basilisk, s. Minus three slots, silence heal, monsieur houch, a plus. I was lucky to have found the basilisk's body before entering the tomb of the stab. Vikir had absorbed the mummy of a basilisk that had been pickled in salt and acquired its regenerative power as his own. I could say I was really lucky. 
With the regenerative power of a bog salamander, it wouldn't have been able to survive the cane corso's blow. Anyway. Due to the power of the magic sword Beelzebub, the cure escaped death. And in return, I was able to reach a higher level. What one finally realizes at the threshold of death is the date consciousness. Those who become sword masters usually do not have much to fight for their lives, and this is where stagnation occurs. Even after stepping into the realm of supremacy, only those who continue to run without resting with the same mindset as when they first picked up the sword will gain something. Cain Corso's words were the most basic and the closest to the correct answer. Meanwhile, Bikir raised his head and looked at the Cain Corso in front of him. Ambush swordsmanship. Was it you who wrote that law book? No. Is that possible? I, too, have not yet learned all of the ten types written in that swordsmanship book. Then. As Vikir trailed off, the Cain Corso nodded obediently. I, too, am just a descendant who read the book of swordsmanship. However, I was afraid that someone other than me would learn this, so I tore a few pages and scattered them. In that case, wouldn't it have been better to just burn it down? I couldn't muster up the courage to abolish the prosecutor's office itself. How dare I destroy that enormous treasure with my own hands? Vikir did not bother to tell the Cain Corso that he had burned the sword book. On the other hand, it seemed very surprising that a descendant of the Cain Corso appeared who had obtained a complete copy of the ambush swordsmanship book. As expected, will people who are related meet somehow? Cain Corso retrieved his great sword. He meant that he would no longer attack Vikir. At the same time, all the heavy pressure that had been weighing on the surroundings disappeared. Vikir also had no intention of fighting anymore. He had just stepped on the brink of death, barely returned alive, and had just reached the level of the Eighth Consciousness. On the other hand, the opponent had already reached Type 9 a very long time ago. Even if we fight, there is no way we can be an opponent. At that time, the Cain Corso spoke. My young rival and relative, my cute nephew. Come here and take what you want. It was a different and obedient attitude from before. Vikir asked with a puzzled expression. Can I take the ghost tree behind the iron throne? Do whatever you want. To me, it's just a weed. Isn't this only meaningful to wizards? Weren't you here to protect this? Of course not. I'm here for a completely different reason. These grass roots are, well, ancestral creatures that took root in this tower before me, so I just respect them and have no particular attachment to them. Vikir tilted his head. Eventually, the two roots of the wraith tree behind the iron throne came into Vikir's hands. It was an eerie sapling that was dry and hard, yet somehow cold and damp. Vikir turned his head. The cane corso has been sitting on the iron throne again for some time. However, the curious eyes looking at Vikir still remained. Vikir quietly looked at the cane corso. Meat eating. A level that can be reached only by letting go of emotions. Seven meals. A level that can be reached only by regaining emotions. Eight meals. This is a level that can only be reached if it is supported by attachment to life and harsh practical experience. In fact, it could be said that the state of eight consciousness is a stage that is difficult to experience unless guided by a senior at the upper level of the supreme realm. Or it really requires a lot of effort. So what is the level of obsolescence? When Vikir was alone and thinking, the Cain Corso spoke. Are you curious about the state of type 9? It was the perfect answer. Vikir expressed his approval with silence, but the Cain Corso smiled slightly. You probably won't be able to reach this level in your lifetime. Vikir frowned, wondering if it was a provocation. However, the Cain Corso continued speaking in a serious tone. This is because the realm of Type 9 is beyond the threshold of death. That means that only when one truly dies can one step into the realm of the ninth type. But then, what is the Cain Corso in front of you now? Hasn't he definitely reached the level of the ninth type? As Vikir looked puzzled, the Cain Corso put down his great sword and raised both hands. Tsutsutsutsu. Soon, a black aura boils over. Empty. Wow. The heavy iron gloves covering the Cain Corso's hands fell to the ground. Vikir's eyes opened wide. The Cain Corso's exposed hand was dry, 
with only bones and skin remaining. Like the hands of a corpse. So I crossed the threshold of death and entered into it. As a result, the Cain Corso died. Alone and lonely in a remote place where no one in the world knows. But he never regretted it until the last moment. Because in exchange for that lonely death, he came closer to the Supreme Court than any human had been able to reach for centuries. A noble knight who rose to the rank of superhuman died and was transformed. Death Knight. That was the true identity of the Cain Corso. Episode 260, The Tomb of the Sting, 6. Death Knight. Risk Level, A+. Size. Location of Discovery. A.K.A. Death Knight. The result of a knight who had noble strength and spirit while alive being consumed by the abyss. The mana of the negative dimension, which is infinitely drawn from beyond the gates of death, continues until the body crumbles and the soul wears out and disappears. However, there is still nothing known about what happens when a being who fails to repay the debt passes through another door behind the door of death. Death Knight A noble knight who rose to the rank of superhuman died and was transformed. The power they possess varies so greatly from individual to individual that it is meaningless to calculate the risk level. This is because the results vary greatly depending on the strength and mental power of the knight who becomes a death knight, and the environment and process of being processed into a death knight. Once it has appeared, it is certain that it is unconditionally assumed to have a danger level of A plus or higher, but no death knight that is more dangerous than that has ever appeared in the past 100 years. But Vikir had an intuition at this moment. The cane corso in front of me is clearly something more than a dangerous S-rank monster like Madame Eight Legs or Basilisk. I crossed the threshold of death and entered it. The cane corso calmly spoke of his death. I walked lonely and alone in a remote place that no one in the world knew about. But he never regretted it until the last moment of his life. Because in exchange for that lonely death, I came closer to the supreme court that no human had been able to reach for centuries. It is a level that can only be reached by experiencing death. Vikir swallowed his sleep after hearing the conditions of type 9. Meat eating, six forms. A state that can only be reached by transcending all emotions. Chiel sick, seven postures. A state that can be reached only by regaining the feelings that have been abandoned. Eight types, eight postures. A state that can only be reached by holding a sword as if you were reborn and going through countless cruel battles again. And the nine forms were truly an inaccessible zone at the core of the supreme realms that only those who had experienced death could ascend to. After excluding and excluding emotions to the extent that he had no one he loved throughout his life, Bakir became a carnivore, and due to his reunion with Camus, he became a seven star. And in the end, he reached the eightfold consciousness due to his deep passion for studying under the Cain Corso. But despite this, I couldn't understand anything about Type 9 that I just heard. To become a being higher than the Sword Master, you have to be reborn and die again. This is a truly ridiculous training method. It was a level so far away that it was hard to believe even for Vakir who had reached the level of the eighth type. But now, before my eyes, there is a human who has reached Type 9. Surprisingly, he even threw away his life. The Cain Corso who became a death knight spoke with darkness flowing from the depths of his eyes. For this reason, it is said that it is impossible for you to become old during your lifetime. This is an area that denies all common human understanding, empathy, understanding, faith, common sense, probability, and causality. A being who has not experienced death can never set foot here. Ah, it looks like you have a lot of regrets in life. But. I guess I'm at an age where I haven't even really thought about death yet. Cain Corso spoke while sitting on the Iron Throne. You are not ready yet. He drew a line in one word. It was a boundary that made the trajectories of this side and that side, this world and the afterlife, differ. Vikir asked the Cain Corso, who shook his head with a disappointed expression. What kind of preparation are you talking about? I will definitely reach the eighth meal and become the owner of the tower. Vikir couldn't understand what he was saying. However, he had one more question. So what about Formula 10? Have you realized that it is impossible to get to level 10? Does it actually exist? Of course, it actually exists. However, even I, the owner of the tower, do not realize it yet. 
the Cain Corso opened his mouth in a heavy voice. Did you say that you have to experience death to get to type 9? Yes. To get to type 10, you must die and wake up. After hearing Cain Corso's words, Bakir half opened his mouth in bewilderment. Following the state that one cannot climb to even after death while alive, a state that cannot be reached even after death has emerged. It's absurd that you have to die to get to type 9, but to get to type 10, you have to die and come back to life. I'm not saying you should die, I'm saying you should die. And then I die and wake up. What kind of nonsense logic is that? Vikir frowned, as if he couldn't understand at all. Then the cane corso smiled faintly. I don't understand what that means either, so I'm still stuck in type 9. How can I wake up when I'm already dead? I may never reach level 10. To him, not being able to reach the 10 consciousnesses is the same as not being able to reach rest. Although the Cain Corso died and became a death knight, he did not know how to escape the bondage of death and become a human again. I had no intention of doing so. So does that mean he will have to spend the rest of his life, the incredibly long time left, here alone? At an age when you should have a gravekeeper for your own grave, you end up becoming a gravekeeper for someone else's grave? Only then did Vikir begin to wonder why this huge tower existed. And the cane corso began to open its mouth as if looking into Vikir's head. This, grave of the stings is the tomb of a great Baskerville. What he said was surprising. The place where the Baskerville ancestors who created the Baskerville style of swordsmanship that Vikir learned was born is the, cradle of the blade. And the place where he died became the, grave of the stabbing. His birth was like the birth of a sword, and his death was like the death of a sword. Vikir nodded quietly. Perhaps the ambush sword technique he learned was also invented by him. Cain Corso said. This is his grave and also the final destination for those who pursue the ultimate intention of the sword. Also, he added at the end. A true Baskerville will come here at the end of its life. All Baskervilles are born in the cradle of stings. However, the only one who can close his eyes in the grave of the stings is the Baskerville of Baskervilles, the truly great Baskerville. The endings of the great Baskervilles are all the same. After passing through his cradle, we come to his grave. It will be the same for you too. Children who come out of the cradle of the stab are doomed to sleep in the grave of the stab, so Vikir will also return here. But Vikir snorted. I have a lot to do outside. I will not return to this desolate and idle place. Is there a lot of work to do? He he he, life isn't as great as you think. It is just a formula that exists between the problem and the answer. As humans live, they undergo and undergo numerous rituals. Birth ceremonies, coming of age ceremonies, coronation ceremonies, weddings, funerals, etc. How much work is there to do? It is a long equation that connects the question of birth and the answer of death. At this age, you won't even think about such petty pretense and pretense. The cane corso just stroked its beard. Yet. Thud. The tower shook once. The tomb of the stabbing began to shake. What? Vikir was taken aback by the strong wind that suddenly blinded his eyes. Coo 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 coo. Beyond the swirling storm, the cane corso's appearance was gradually fading away. I'll see you again someday. Those were the Cain Corso's last words. At the same time, Bakir noticed white sand grains mixing in with the storm. For some reason, the sand from the salt flat was filling the inside of the tower. Tsutsutsutsutsutsu. And soon the wind calmed down. Bakir realized that he was standing on a barren desert. The grave of the stabbing. The huge tower had disappeared without a trace. It felt like I was having a long dream. But what Vikir experienced was not a dream. Because somehow he was holding two hard saplings in his hands. Ghost tree. A strange plant that was taking root behind the iron throne. It was an op part exclusively for warlocks that Pomerian wanted. It's not a dream. This energy boiling from his body clearly proved that Vikir himself had risen to the next level. Sword Master of Type 8. Now, I am confident that I will not lose even if I face Hugo. Vikir raised his head. 
However, the Cane Corso who was supposed to say thank you had already disappeared beyond the salt storm along with the grave of the stab. In the sunny desert, there is not even a mirage, let alone an illusion. Vakir bowed his head towards the Iron Throne, which he had been facing vividly just a moment ago. And then he turned around, holding the two roots of the ghost tree firmly in his hands. Towards the Baskervilles and Colossio Academy. Episode 261, The Inverted Pentagram, 1. Iron-Blooded Swordsman Slash Difficulty 5 Stars. The student in question solved all the problems presented by the home school excellently. Householder Hugo Les Baskerville. The certificate that Baskerville's quest had been cleared surprised everyone at the four major academies. Varangian's deputy director, Basilius, Themiscarus principal, Hippolyte, the Tower of Magic's tower owner, Blue Whale, and even Colossio's banshee professor gaped. How long has it been since the iron blood test gave you a passing certificate? Hmm, if this is real. Because the Baskerville family is so closed off, there are a lot of suspicions. He 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 dash. Basilius, Hippolyte, and Blue Whale looked at the letter again and again in disbelief. At that time. Widely. There was a hand that snatched it away with a cold look. It was Professor Banshee. Are you doubting my student now? The other representatives smiled shyly in front of Professor Banshee, who openly showed his displeasure. Meanwhile, Professor Banshee looked back at Vakir in front of him and spoke in a cold tone. You probably know that you are the last to return out of the ten rankers, right? Yes. Vakir nodded obediently. Strangely enough, a considerable amount of time had passed since I came out of the grave of the stings. There seemed to be something inside it that distorted the flow of time. I didn't even know if the top floor of the tower was where the cane corso was. There might be something else on top of it. While Vakir was thinking about something else, Professor Banshee continued to display a cynical attitude. You're still good at answering one question. Thank you. Do I look like I'm giving a compliment right now? Sorry. When Vakir gave only the necessary answer, Professor Banshee furrowed his eyebrows. Mr. Vakir. Because you returned late, the artifact presentation ceremony was pushed back ten days. There has been no reply from the Baskervilles so far. We even tried to report him missing. Do you know? The mission was so urgent that I didn't have time to contact you on the way. What on earth was the mission? Vikir obediently answered Professor Banshee's question. Recovering the ghost tree. At those words, the expressions of all four school representatives suddenly changed. Ma, it's a revenant tree. That's nonsense. Nothing like that exists. He 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 he, it's a funny joke. Basilius, Hippolyte, and the blue whale treated Vakir's answer as mere nonsense. However, Professor Banshee had a hard expression on his face and was silent. Because he knows Vakir's character. Finally, Professor Banshee asked in a stern tone. Speaking of the revenant tree are you referring to the tree of the imaginary world that appears in the myth of Jersey, the greatest morgue, and Ornati, the greatest Baskerville? Yes. The Baskervilles asked you to retrieve it? Yes. So. So you succeeded in retrieving it? I can't answer that. Vikir did not answer. I only glanced at the certificate with the seal of the Baskerville family. And as Vakir's gaze moved and returned, the school principal's gaze also moved and returned. Yet. Professor Banshee said, shaking his head. I don't know what it is. We'll talk about this later. First of all, congratulations on completing the quest. The short interview with the school principal's ended. Yet. All ten students gathered, including Vakir, who returned last. They now go to the warehouse where numerous artifacts are stored, beyond the gate that opens when all four keys are collected. Blue Whale, the owner of the Magic Tower, said with a grin. The limited time is one day. If you can't get out of the warehouse, the door will close and never open again. We cannot open the doors until the next competition, so please strictly adhere to the time limit. Afterwards, he added a word in a playful tone. Ah. For your information, you don't need to pay attention to the skeletons you see as soon as you cross the gate. 
These are the words of those who failed to get out of the warehouse because they were unable to select an artifact within the time limit. It was somehow a creepy joke. All ten students entered the gate while all students from the four schools watched. And when exactly 23 hours had passed, nine students escaped from the warehouse. With everyone selected by the artifact. This was quite unusual, considering that there were always one or two people in every competition who, despite being ranked in the top ten, came out empty-handed because they were not selected for any artifacts. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, and Bianca were also gathered in front of the gate waiting for their friend. Wow! It came out. It came out. Sinclair. It's here. Oh oh. I guess I picked an artifact. Congratulations, Sinclair. Look. You said you could do it. Sinclair, who looked tired but had a bright complexion, came out of the gate and waved to everyone. Eventually, all students who came out of the gate reported which artifact they had chosen and which artifact they had chosen. The first was Dolores. She came out holding a small mirror in her arms that was big enough for her to hug. The artifact I obtained is the Mirror of Truth. It is said that it shows the bare face behind the mask of the reflected object. They say it only applies to people within the range they can handle. After speaking, she lifted the mirror and glanced at Lovegood's face standing next to her. Then, in the mirror, Lovegood's face is seen without any makeup. Aya. What are you doing? You. I even had my makeup done before coming out. Why, you're just pretty. Lovegood hastily removes her face from the mirror. Dolores looked at him and smiled. Next was Lovegood. She, the student council president of Themyscira and the president of the newly formed Vakir fan club, shouted with ambition. The artifact I got is Love Shield. It's a hairpin with a heart shaped brooch. It is said that if you wear it, it will block any kind of powerful brainwashing or mental magic. But they say it only works if the person you truly love is by your side. At first glance, it was an artifact that didn't look that good. In general, the artifacts obtained by other students were semi-permanent, while those had a usage limit. But for some reason, Lovegood seemed quite satisfied. What do you want to use it for? See, don't worry. Dolores and Lovegood, who have become very close, are having a bickering conversation. At that time. Ha 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 ha. With a cheerful laugh, Bakaraga took out an artifact. It was a huge glove made of an unidentified metal. These are gauntlets that increase your strength. It's called, Madong King's Hand. It's a gauntlet worn by a legendary warrior named King Madong, who lived in another dimension a long time ago. Similar to me. I got a staff that increases mana. It is said that a very small amount of pink dragon scales were contained. Is there a dragon like that in the first place? Hohenheim nodded in response to Bakaraga's words. Next were the three brothers High Bro, Middle Bro, and Low Bro. We got the triplet swords, which are said to make us stronger when we come together. It's called, Three Swords. You do. You do. The guys held out three swords that looked the same but were subtly different. Uniquely, it is said that if three pieces are gathered in one place, their power is doubled. These triplets, called the Trident of the Baskervilles, were chosen first by the artifacts and seemed very proud of that. At that time. What is this to me? A sullen voice was heard. Grenui. The guy walked out looking somewhat downcast. What was in her hand was a small brooch shaped like a lip. This artifact is called Applied Lips. They tell you the truth no matter what the question is. But they only answer, yes, and no, and they say you can only use it once in your life. At that time. There was a hand tapping Granui's shoulder. Why does it seem like a very good artifact? It was Sinclair. Sometimes I have a lot of doubts about whether I am living well. I think it would be a good idea to ask at that time. Tisk, why do I have such skepticism? I'm always living well. People should be confident. But even though Granui was grumbling, he was in a much better mood on the inside. Finally, Sinclair reported his artifact. The artifact that chose me was, hat with lots of money. 
It's a hat whose magic power becomes stronger the more you spend money on it. It was a strange-looking black hat, like something only witches would wear. The brim, which is worn here and there or has teeth missing, looks dark and far from wealthy. Everyone around me reacted with sadness. Isn't Sinclair the most money-strapped student at Colosio? While most students receive support from their parents for living expenses and tuition, the rumor that she was covering everything from tuition to living expenses through part-time work was already widespread. In such a situation, to be chosen for an artifact that costs so much money, how could this be anything but a pie in the sky? But Sinclair was still courageous. Hee <laughs> hee, it's a world where money is power. I have to make a lot of money to wear this hat. He just smiles brightly as usual. Time passes as other students come out one by one and register their artifacts. Yet. The hands of the clock have already made one big turn. Time has continued to pass since the ninth Sinclair reported the artifact. And before we know it, it's time for it to end. There is now less than a minute left until the gate closes. However, there was one student who had not yet come out. Vikir. Students from all the academies are gathered here and waiting for this one non-returnee. All the students, including Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Sinclair, and Bianca, mutter as if they are anxious. Vikir, what are you doing? Why aren't you coming out? It's a big deal. There's not much time left. Now it's seconds. Oh my god. Well, don't worry. Hyung, he'll come out at the last moment. Anyway, I really like playing the main character I came last in the second exam as well. Everyone was looking at the gate, unable to hide their anxiety and nervousness. But. In the end, no one came out of the gate. Spot. The gate's duration has ended. It closed in vain. Uh. Everyone who was watching this suddenly swallowed the wind. Blank face. Expressions of disbelief in reality. The first person to scream was Professor Banshee. Open it. Open the gate. Not one of my students has come out yet. But that was impossible. The rule for the four academies is to open the gates only once a year, when everyone is gathered, for 24 hours. This was a system that had been in place for a very long time, and it was not something that deans could open at will. In the first place, the warehouse and the portal itself are independent parts, and it is impossible for wizards in this world to control it other than maintaining and repairing it. Knowing this, the other deans could not help but lower their heads with solemn and gloomy expressions. Although it is extremely rare, it is not completely absent. People who are greedy for too many artifacts and run out of time without being able to choose one of them. They are often found with nothing but their skeletons at the entrance when the gate opens the following year. It is the price of greed. Oh, no. Tudor approached where the gate was. Sancho, Piggy, and Bianca also stood next to him with devastated expressions. W what happened now? Vikir couldn't come out. Really? Is the gate closed? Can't I open this again? When entering the gate, the only things you can take with you are inorganic items such as clothes and shoes. Everything except your own body burns when you pass through the gate. So it is pointless to bring food or water separately. In other words, people trapped in warehouses have no choice but to wither and die from loneliness and starvation. No. Mr. Vakir. The entire fan club, including Love Good, cries and shouts. But no matter how desperately I called, there was nothing I could do about the gate, which was already closed. Dolores was looking at the gate with a blank expression. You're lying, right? In fact, you were there before me, right? But looking around, there are no signs of that. Vikir was trapped inside. I can't come out now. Dolores just stood there dumbfounded by the unbelievable accident. Around. This time. Run down. Look like. The feeling as if my heart had dropped all the way to the bottom of my ribs and stopped. My eyes were dizzy and my legs were starting to feel weak. When Dolores was about to open her mouth to say something about this confusing feeling that she did not know about. Puck. An unfamiliar roar was heard from somewhere. It sounds like a knife cutting through very thick leather. What? 
The expression of Blue Whale, the owner of the Magic Tower, changed suddenly. Blah blah blah. The barrier was being torn apart. And a face is slowly revealed through the cracks. Sorry. It's a little late. Vikir still had a calm expression. Episode 262, The Inverted Pentagram, 2. Puck. Blah blah blah. The barrier was being torn apart. And a face is slowly revealed through the cracks. Sorry. It's a little late. Vikir still had a calm expression. But the crowd is quiet. Everyone just stands there blankly with their mouths wide open. Ah, the artifact I brought. Can I report it here? Vikir also lifts the artifact with a calm expression. It was a small necklace shaped like an inverted pentagram, an ominous artifact with a closed eye in the center. The name and effect of this artifact. The moment when Vikir was about to explain something. Wow, bro. There was one person who jumped into Vikir's arms. A face covered in tears and snot. It was Sinclair. The moment when Vikir tilts his head. Vikir, you bastard. A rough tackle came soon after. Tudor, who was in tears, was hugging Vikir tightly. Sancho and PG came running after them. Bianca stood behind him with her arms crossed. Vikir. What happened? I was worried because I thought I couldn't come out. What the? I heard he also gets into a lot of secret troubles. And behind them, the three brothers High Bro, Middle Bro, and Low Bro are standing with an anxious attitude. Because of the attention of those around him, he couldn't come and talk to him and seemed to just be nervous at a distance. At that time, Dolores stepped in front of Vikir. The two made eye contact and said nothing. Dolores didn't say anything else. But. Don't worry. He only left a brief remark befitting the president. At that time, Professor Banshee stepped forward and put all this confusion to rest. Vikir Kuhn. Yes. How did it come out? Before we knew it, Professor Banshee had returned to his cold demeanor. As everyone knows, this gate can only be opened and closed with four keys. And that only happens once a year, for 24 hours. There is only one way to forcefully tear this barrier. Is it something like a sword master or a seventh class wizard or higher releasing power with all their might, not from the outside but from the inside? So I have no choice but to ask a question. About how you tore the barrier. Representatives of Varangian, Themyscira, and the Tower of Magic came to Professor Banshee's side. They too are curious. This is the first time I have seen this barrier torn since I became the Varangian's deputy director. Do you think I can tear it apart? Maybe it would be possible if we put all our effort into it from inside the barrier. He he he, but it's absolutely too much for just one student. Students from other schools are also curious about how Vikir escaped from the warehouse. Numerous eyes were focused on Vikir. Vikir answered in a calm tone. I was lucky. It just so happened that this artifact was used to dismantle the barrier. Finally, Bakir lifted the necklace hanging around her neck. The red inverted pentagram remained silent as if it would never move unless it was Bakir's will. Deans of other schools, including Professor Banshee, tilted their heads. That must be this item was in the far corner of the warehouse. But wasn't that a shelf? You're right. That's a shelf. A shelf where artifacts were placed. Why did it get so small? Vikir came out carrying not an artifact, but a shelf where the artifact was stored. And for some reason, the shelf was reduced to the size of a necklace. Professor Banshee swallowed. Is it? Well, since it was in a warehouse storing artifacts, the shelf must not have been an ordinary item. You managed to recognize me well. Thank you. Okay. The purpose of it was to tear the barrier? Yes. Can you show the effect? It's because it's an artifact that hasn't been registered in the inventory. I'm sorry, but that's not possible. Since I've already used the ability once, I don't know when I'll be able to use it next time. Maybe I won't be able to use it forever. Among the artifacts in the warehouse, there were many that were disposable or had a very long cooldown. 
Therefore, Professor Banshee and other deans were unable to investigate further about Bakir's artifact. When you see it with your eyes or touch it with your hands, it is just an ordinary hard mineral. It was the same even when I drained the mana. The other wizards who had been looking at the reverse pentagram for a while also all came to the same conclusion. It is now a worthless item. In the end, this mysterious artifact was recorded only through Vakir's testimony. It was simply a one-time use artifact for the purpose of tearing down a barrier. Twenty-four hours ago. Vakir crossed the barrier and entered the warehouse. The other nine students were scattered all over the place, each receiving a call from the artifacts calling them. Vikir looked around quietly. A space lined with large stone pillars. It is a warehouse that is clearly divided into sections. There were numerous artifacts scattered on the floor. Rings, necklaces, staffs, swords, shields, helmets, shoes, etc. All of them are oparts filled with magical energy. And on the large shelf at the very back were several artifacts that were particularly powerful. There were swords emitting red hot energy armor emitting black aura, and rings and necklaces emitting blue or green light. Perhaps some high-ranking artifacts with particularly strong energy were stored separately on a shelf. Most of the children picked out the artifacts that fell on the floor, focusing on those that emit beams of light towards them. Eventually, after all the children left the warehouse, only Vakir was left alone in the warehouse. Is everyone gone? Vakir turned his head again after seeing that he was alone in the warehouse. Numerous artifacts were emitting rays of love toward Vakir. Vakir quietly looked at the artifacts that had chosen him. Shoes that allow you to walk quickly, glasses that allow you to see great distances, a flute that can put everything around you to sleep, a water seed that can extinguish all fire, and an ember that can evaporate all water. A mirror that shows one's future spouse, a ring that takes one's life and the other's life at the same time, etc. Each one is a very useful item. But Vikir didn't pay attention to anything. What he seemed to be worried about was just waiting for all the other students to leave. Giapuk, 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 Giapuk. Vikir walked forward without even paying attention to the numerous treasures. There were special oparts that were emitting unusually strong magical power. Top oparts that even prominent rankers such as Dolores, Bakira, Hohenheim, and Lovegood did not select. They were all emitting a light of love towards Vikir. However, Vikir did not touch any of them. But, Warmer, I just grabbed the shelf where the oparts were placed with my hand and dropped them all on the ground. Eventually, Vikir looked down at the large, empty shelf. I finally found it. Seventh Hour Decorabia. The shelf that supported the oparts. A red inverted pentagram that no one paid attention to. But Vikir knew from future experience. This shelf is the real reason the warehouse exists, and the rest of the parts are all just a gimmick. Tsutsutsutsutsutsu. Vikir infused magical energy into his hand, which was tightly gripped on the shelf. Unlike other opats, the shelf showed no reaction even when touched by Vikir's mana. But. Suk. Vikir felt a huge amount of mana draining from his body. A wave of mana that is sucked in like an ebbing tide. This strange shelf is now sucking up Vikir's magic like a lump of water in a drought. Indeed. There must be a reason why so many opats are being suppressed. Vikir tightened his grip on the shelf and looked around. All the oparts that had been shining brightly just a moment ago, asking me to choose them, all lost their light in an instant and became quiet. The oparts that were at the top also fell off the shelves and rolled on the floor, but were quiet. It does not emit light or tremble but simply remain silent. Fear. Fear. These magic tools were clearly afraid of something. But I am not afraid of you. Vikir lowered his head and looked at the inverted pentagram in front of him. I have already defeated three demon lords of the same level. There was no reason to feel fear again. Kwa wa ya. Vikir instead gave strength to the mana that was being sucked in. The power of my whole body surges like a storm. Since ascending to the level of a sword master, mana, which had become deeper and more dense, spurted out with tremendous force towards the reverse star. Swoosh swoosh swoosh. The size of the inverted pentagram, 
which was merely supporting a few upper parts, suddenly began to increase. What used to be the size of a large shelf has now grown into a large table, beyond that to a large bookcase, and beyond that to the point where it fills the entire warehouse. Beads of sweat began to seep from Bakir's forehead. A battle of mana. Who will win? Bakir felt blood flowing out between his clenched teeth and tensed his whole body. The blood vessels in the whole body pulsate as if they are about to burst, and mana gushes out. All of it, without a single limit. Right then. Thud. The red inverted bell rang loudly once. Bakir felt that the flow of mana being sucked out of his body had stopped. At the same time. Damn it. Quick. A crack began to appear in the center of the inverted pentagram. The gold grew bigger and bigger, and soon it became an eye and opened brightly. Flash. At the exact center of the inverted pentagram, a single, bloodshot eye looked high up. Cool. An eerie and eerie voice is heard from the center of the black air current. K ha ha ha. Now the magic power is fully filled. The time has come to open the gates of the abyss and destroy humanity. Despair, you weaklings. I, Decoravia, have descended. Seven times, seven corpses, Decoravia. It opens its single blood-red eye and casts an ominous light into the world. An enormous force of evil was emanating from the tip of the five-pronged horn. At that time. At that moment, Bakir's gaze met Decoravia's. Decoravia looked slightly embarrassed when he met Bakir's gaze, who was looking up at him from below. Yet. Decorabia slowly rolled his eyes and looked to the left. And then he rolls his eyes again and looks to the right. Does not exist. Countless corpses piled up, blood flowing in rivers, fire burning all the way to the sky, and the earth covered in ash. And the gate leading to the demon world. There was nothing. All there is is empty darkness. Only then did Decorabia roll his eyes at Bakir below and ask with a slight hint of curiosity. I, excuse me, but who are you? It was quite an awkward attitude. Episode 263, The Inverted Pentagram, 3 An eerie and eerie voice is heard from the center of the black air current. K ha ha ha. Every hair, every toe. My whole body is overflowing with great power. Now the magic power is fully filled. I swear right here and now. The most taboo place in this dimension. I will open the abyss gate leading to the abyss and annihilate humans on this earth. Despair, you weak and foolish beings. And scream. This body, Decoravia, a being who brings great destruction, has appeared on this land. Seven times, seven corpses, Decoravia. It opens its single blood-red eye and casts an ominous light into the world. Seventh poem, Decorabia. Risk level, S+. Plus. Size. Discovery location, deep inside the gate of destruction, snake's womb. A.K.A. the seventh corpse. A natural enemy of mankind, one of the ten plagues known as incomprehensible and unkillable. They will sweep away food like a swarm of locusts. Ten Commandments 10 colon 1. Vikir looked at the huge inverted pentagram in front of him. What's wrong with a subject without hair or toes? Meanwhile, Decorabia is rolling his eyes in confusion, as if he is not understanding what is going on. But Vikir understood the situation accurately. Decorabia. The only inanimate demon among the ten sanctuary. There are various forms of demons, but the most unusual one is this inanimate demon. In fact, there is always a lot of controversy as to whether these beings should be viewed as just objects or demons. Depending on the era, it was Decoravia that was classified as a demon, and sometimes as an artifact. However, Decoravia's abilities were definitely diabolical, beyond ordinary artifacts. Its effect is quite simple, with only one effect, creating a shield. Decoravia's shield is a strange shield that grows larger and stronger the more mana it absorbs. Of course, there is a limit to its defensive power, but it has growth depending on the amount of mana absorbed, so it is quite versatile. Vikir recalled the Era of Destruction. Decoravia, which grew huge after receiving the mana of the other nine demons, became a large shield that defended against all attacks from the human alliance. 
A battlefield where everything is on fire, a shield of inverted pentagrams standing in front of countless exhausted human heroes. It was too huge to be called a shield. It would have been more appropriate to call it a wall, an insurmountable, wailing wall. The heroes who were able to break through that absolute defense could be counted on one hand. The high red wall and the black ghost trees growing behind it were enough to kill the spirit of humans. But. Vikir has already obtained the wraith tree. And now even Decoravia was in front of me. Destruction is possible now. Decoravia, which has not yet absorbed much mana, has succeeded in finding this guy before the ten sanctions can find it, so all that remains is to destroy it. At that time, Bakir was about to unleash the Sword Master's aura and destroy Decoravia. I, excuse me, but who are you? Decoravia spoke up. Bakir gave a simple answer. The one who woke you up. Person. You mean human. Oh, in my memory, the human race originally had a more stooped waist and was covered in hair all over. They carried spears and swords made of ground stone. Decorabia, hearing that he was a human, began to lose his voice again. Are you really saying you are a human? Okay. After finishing speaking, Bakir tried to swing his sword again. The current Decorabia is much smaller and weaker than when it was called the Wailing Wall, so it could be destroyed if enough time was given. But. Decorabia's next words were surprising enough to stop Bakir's sword. Good night. A weak but lucky human being. I will throw off my current shackles and prepare to welcome a new contractor. As of now, the contract with the demons has been cancelled. Let us begin anew our contract with the humans. The representative of the contractor is you. Ruler. Come on, come up with a code of conduct, human. What do you want? You will use me to achieve your grand ambition. Vikir paused his sword for a moment. Program. Are you asking me to give some command? As Vikir stands there with a puzzled expression, Decorabia also looks puzzled and closes his eyes. There was a moment of awkward silence between the two. Finally, Decorabia spoke. What are you, human? Are you sure you didn't know what kind of person I was and woke me up? No. He's a devil. Kaha. Well, that's only half true. To be exact, it is a being that was a devil. Decorabia continued speaking in a rather kind tone, unlike his initially terrifying voice. I am the first being under the influence of a being awakened from sleep. You're influenced by the person who wakes you up. Yes. This body falls into a deep sleep every 1000 years, and my disposition for the next 1000 years is determined depending on who wakes me up first. Humans have known Decoravia as demons for about 1000 years at most. There is no way to know what kind of existence Decoravia was before that. In the era of destruction that Vikir experienced, the person who first awakened Decoravia was a devil, so it existed as a devil, but before that, it may have been a completely different entity. Decorabia said that there was a time, a long time ago, when he was considered an angel. Hmm. Vikir thought for a moment. And then he continued speaking. Then I woke you up, so you will follow my orders for a thousand years. Okay. Yes. Our relationship is. At the very least, it will appear in the oral lore representative of your species. Above all, your species has a short lifespan. Decorabia spoke confidently, but that was out of Vikir's interest in the first place. I heard you well. At the same time. Phew. An aura burned at the tip of Vikir's sword. Ha. Huh. What are you doing, human? Why did you give me a knife, ha? Huh? Decorabia could not finish his sentence. This is because Vikir suddenly swung his sword and attacked Decorabia. Decorabia began to writhe in pain and squeeze tears out of his single eye. Uh ha ha what are you doing, human no, contractor? Why on earth are you trying to harm my body? Because we can destroy it now. Well, that's right. Why are you trying to destroy it in the first place? The devil kills. Bakir briefly dismissed the comment. Pack. Quack 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 quack. Once again, Bakir's sword struck Decoravia in a complex trajectory. Kwawea. Now, wait a minute. Wait. 
Just wait. Then why are you trying to kill the devil? That's because the devil wants to harm humans. Really? Well, then I'm not a devil anymore. In the first place, I am neither a devil nor a god, but just an object typo parts. I don't believe in what the devil says. Vikir slashed his sword once again. Use a jijijic. Dekarabia's huge body began to get smaller and smaller. Of course, he just screamed, tears pouring down his face. Really? No, it's real. I just quit being a devil. I don't believe in what the devil says. You crazy guy. It's real. I told you earlier. See if you can feel the devil's energy in my body. At those words, Bakir stopped sharpening his sword for a moment. Now that I think about it, I haven't felt it since before. The smell of the devil filled the warehouse not long ago. It means real. Black, black, black. Dekarabia started crying like a little girl. Vikir stopped hitting Dekarabia for a moment. Hmm is it? Then, is it no longer a devil? Okay. I do not lie. But even so, it would be better to destroy it here before it falls into the hands of demons. Well, since you are the one who woke me up, there is no use even if the demons get their hands on me. For the next thousand years, I will have no choice but to work for humans. Dekarabia desperately shouted at Vikir, who was looking down at him with a suspicious expression. I am quite useful. He has the keen eye to distinguish between Oparts and is knowledgeable about things in the world from long ago. You can also make a shield. Vikir seemed a little interested in the word shield in Dekarabia's words. Because of my memories before returning, I knew how awesome Dekarabia's shield was. Wailing Wall If only mana was provided, it would be possible to build a barrier of absolute defense. When Vikir looked like he was thinking for a moment, Dekarabia spoke hurriedly. Look! How great I am! Dekarabia shifted his gaze to the side. Then, I saw a red-hot magic sword that looked like it was going to fly towards me at any moment. It was an Oparts that had been placed on top of Dekarabia, which had been serving as a shelf until not long ago. That is the, Giant Sword of Anger Management Disorder. This is the sword of the Giant King that was legendary long ago. Although it has great attack power, it has been sealed for a long time due to its crazy aggressiveness that attacks everything around it. When Dekarabia narrowed his eyes, all the chains binding the sword broke. Soon, the huge sword began to fly towards Vakir, drawing a red-hot trajectory. Dekarabia said to Vakir. Human. Come on, put your hands on my body and use your mana. And draw an image in your head. What image? Anything. Be it a shield, wall or barrier. Anything that can protect you. Vikir put his hand on Dekarabia with a shocked expression. Okay. Sigh. I felt a significant amount of additional mana draining away. At the same time. Jaiing. A translucent inverted pentagram was drawn before Vikir's eyes. It seemed to emit red light, and then it struck back the giant's sword and threw it away. Quack. The knife that flew into the corner of the warehouse broke in half. Vikir was once again impressed by the defensive power of Dekarabia's shield, the Whale of Wailing. This much even though I only used a small amount of mana. That knife was definitely a top-level Oparts. If something like that can be broken so easily, then the shield's defense power is really quite high. Vikir rested his chin in thought. How is it? Do you finally feel like you want me? Do you want me do you want to own it? Vikir said indifferently to Dekarabia single eye, which was smiling unpleasantly. Then give me back the mana I put in. Eh. Give it to me or take it away. After all, humans are. Ah, uh, I got it. Put the knife in. When Vikir held out his palm, Dekarabia muttered a little regretfully and then immediately vomited out all of his mana. Vikir felt the mana he had been squeezing out just a moment ago being restored again. At the same time, Dekaravia also became smaller and smaller, eventually shrinking to the size of a baby's palm. Dekaravia took a quick look and quickly clung to Vikir's neck. Squeak tap. A red chain appeared from nowhere and was carefully connected to Vikir's choker. 
It is intended to be subtly disguised as a necklace. Um, what else can I do now, human? Decorabia seems to be very worried that Vikir will pick up a sword again and say something like, the devil kills. Vikir thought for a moment and then opened his mouth. Spew out the information of the ten sages. Not a single thing is left behind. Every. Eh. Information on previous contractors. Decoravia hesitated for a moment, but then caught a glimpse of the aura burning at the tip of Vikir's sword and fell into trouble. Ah, uh, I understand. It's a little bit cruel, but let's cooperate. So please stop saying scary things like destruction and such. Vikir packed the small Decoravia in his arms. Now that he is the owner of Decoravia, there is no need to destroy it. No, rather, it would be an even greater loss to the devil. Knock knock. Vikir patted the Decoravia, which had become small enough to be worn around the neck. Ah. I almost forgot this. I do not react at all to any living being other than you, the contractor representative, so please be careful of that, human. Bikir quietly nodded at the precautions given by Decorabia. Now it's really time to go outside. When I looked around, I saw that all the artifacts had lost their light and were scattered on the floor. He looked intimidated in front of Decorabia. Tsutsut Tsutsutsu. Bikir brought an aura to the end of Beelzebub. Baskerville Type 8. Meeting the Cain Corso who was hiding in the tomb of Calchim was a great help to Vikir's growth. Flash. Soon, the Swordmaster's aura, capable of cutting even things that could not be cut, emanated. Seven large teeth, and an eighth tooth, still small but clear, fiercely tore through the atmosphere filled with darkness. Buck. The sound of the barrier being torn apart erupts loudly. Vikir squeezed through the cracked subspace and went out. The night hound has achieved its goal and now sets out to find its next prey. Ah, I am so lucky. In this life, I have been able to serve such a pretty and beautiful mistress. With a slightly strange partner. Episode 264, Crime Discount Season, 1. After a long journey, Bakir returned to the dormitory at Colossio Academy. Wash first, Bakir. I have something to do first. Something. Ah, I'm going to organize some of my personal work that I put off because of the college league. As soon as Piggy entered his dorm room, he started getting busy with something. It was a piece of paper with complicated numbers, charts, and graphs drawn on it, and it seemed to be something related to finance. Bikir went into the shower room without saying a word. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. The baby madam stood still under the warm water, as if the water was nice. As the black fur flowed down, it looked as if it was melting into water. Normally, I would have patted that little madam's head once Vakir was silent now, only frowning slightly. It's because of the necklace that has been making noise since a while ago. An inverted pentagram necklace hanging from a red chain on a choker around the neck. It was the seventh hour, Decorabia. K ha ha ha. I am Decorabia. A taboo existence. Savior of the species. A mixture of great destruction and grand creation. And in this promotion period, I am lucky enough to have a pretty and beautiful hostess. In the first place, his voice was set to be heard only by Vakir, so Vakir's ears hurt from the constant chatter. Decorabia seemed to like the fact that it was hanging around Vakir's neck and chest, and was in high tension the whole way back. But that good feeling only ended here. The moment Vakir entered the shower room and took off his clothes, Decorabia's continued chatter stopped. Hey contractor. Don't forget to take me with you when you shower, because someone can pick you up a... Uh. The pupils in Decorabia's eyes, which were wide open and almost circular, were shaking. Decorabia stares intently at Vakir's face. And now Decorabia looking down at Vakir again. Meanwhile, Vakir took a shower in silence. Decorabia has already become very quiet. It seemed like he suddenly became less talkative, and now he doesn't move a single thing, as if he has become completely inanimate. My eyes, which had looked up and down several times, suddenly closed. Vikir, who felt strange that the chatter had suddenly stopped, tapped Decorabia with a finger filled with mana. I am. Decorabia. Are you going to give me an order? It's not like that. Then. 
The eyes that were open for a moment closed coldly again. A fairly dry and businesslike answer was all that came back. Well, it's finally quieter. If the results are good, it is good. Vikir nodded with a satisfied expression. When Vikir came out of the shower, Piggy was getting ready to go out. When Vikir was wiping the moisture from his hair with a towel, with his back turned to the cloudy steam coming out of the shower room. Vikir. I'll go out and come back. Piggy said, holding a bunch of documents in his arms. There were so many documents piled up in Piggy's arms that I wondered if he could even see in front of him like that. Bikir asked, sitting on a chair with a towel around his neck. Where are you going? Yes. Go show your personal work to the professor. Personal work refers to work that students do separately to improve their individual abilities, in addition to what is assigned as an assignment by the academy. Piggy said with a big smile. The mock investment competition will be held in a little while. Mock investment competition? Ha! Huh. Well, it is a competition to discover promising stocks or sectors in advance, look at them, and invest in them. The host is the famous bourgeois family. There are many benefits to winning or being ranked. Wasn't the survival contest over? There are all kinds of competitions. That's right. There are so many competitions. There are swordsmanship competitions, archery competitions, and magic competitions. There is a Naphtali contest, an eating contest, a boxing contest, a drama contest, a singing contest, a drawing contest, a contest to raise a great rhinoceros beetle, etc. There have been a lot more events held recently. Since Vikir donated the large sum of money he earned from selling Noel skins to a scholarship foundation, the number of competitions under various names has increased. It was all an excuse to give scholarships to students. Professor Banshee is doing surprisingly well. Vikir nodded quietly. I was skeptical about whether the scholarship foundation would do its job properly, but seeing that it produced tangible results immediately after the survival competition ended, it seemed trustworthy. Meanwhile, Piggy smiled awkwardly as he finished speaking. Because my grades are a bit lacking, the only way I can do is to earn extra points by winning at these competitions to make up for my credits. In fact, his fighting talent in Piggy was average or slightly below that, but he showed excellent talent in all other sports. He is well versed in administration, law, medicine, and art, and also has considerable financial skills. He was particularly good at acquiring, analyzing, and gathering information, and was also knowledgeable about the latest news and current status of prominent figures in society. From what I heard, it has already won several times in contests to raise great rhinoceros beetles. If Thindy Wendy had seen it, she would have made a fuss and said she would scout her right away. Vikir nodded silently. You can do it well. Since Vikir was someone who usually spoke little, the effect of saying good things was great. Thank you always, Vikir. For always encouraging me. Piggy purses his lips as if he is touched. Her eyes also turned red and moist. Soon, Piggy clenched his fists towards Vikir. Good. I'm definitely going to beat that kid this time. That kid? When Vikir asked curiously, Piggy snorted and nodded. Ha! Huh. Sinclair. He also said he was participating in a mock investment competition this time. Sinclair. Chief of the Fever Donation Department. A freshman from a commoner background. Even at Colosio Academy, where only geniuses gather, he is a genius whose name is mentioned here and there especially often. When it came to magic, which was her major, she showed as much talent as the magicians of Morgue, the magic head, and during her minor, cold weapon donation class, she surprised everyone by showing her proficiency in using weapons such as swords, spears, and bows at will. And other than that, she was famous as an alpha girl who could do anything, such as theory if theory, handwriting if written, certificate if certificate, part-time job if it was a part-time job. She even showed off her spirit by taking first and second place in all practical and written exams while working part-time as a librarian at a cafe. In addition, her star potential has already been proven, as she recently recorded an incredible eighth place overall in the college league as a first-year freshman. Piggy said with a burning sense of rivalry. Sinclair also said that he is very good at accounting and office work. So, 
he must be working as a librarian at the library. Is it? Since he didn't know that Sinclair had a talent for economics or investment, Bakir just nodded. Because this mock investment competition is sponsored by a bourgeois family, many students participate for prize money, scholarships, and even employment opportunities after graduation. Maybe Sinclair is like that too. I will never lose. I'll be back. Piggy waved his hand and missed some papers, so he picked them up again and stood up. But I didn't notice the piece of paper that fell behind my heel. Bakir picked it up and tried to hand it to Piggy. Oh, it's okay. That's just a contest poster. You don't have to have it. Piggy waved his hand and ran across the hallway. Soon the room became empty. Vikir sat in front of the desk. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. Don't drool all over me, dirty puppy no, is it a spider? What is this? Madam Baby and Decorabia were placed on the desk. The baby madam is circling around and looking around to see what's so good about Decorabia. Nucleus. Nucleus dash. Aha, uh -huh, I thought you told me not to drool on my body. No, don't touch it, no, don't climb on it, just fall oh, female. Nuclear. Oh my, are you a lady? In that case, I will turn a blind eye to this level of rudeness. In reality, I just close my eyes and surrender myself to your touch. Vikir infused mana into Decoravia and gave orders. Open your eyes. Decorabia thought for a moment and squirmed as if there was nothing he could do. Hmm. Okay. I opened my eyes. A new taste. Maybe, the one with that face that is male is actually better. What are you talking about? I'm telling you to open your eyes and tell me something about Sipsangsi. When Vikir hit him with his palm, Decoravia hurriedly responded. Oh, you mean what I asked earlier? What was it okay? It was related to the sixth poem among the ten poems, right? Yes. Bakir was asking Decoravia for information about his next prey, the sixth Tensangsi. Six o'clock. If he was that guy, he was definitely close friends with Gu Bensi. The two were always together. Decoravia knows information about areas that cannot be known even through Thindiwendi's research. Even though it was a trivial thing, it was of great help. After hearing Decoravia's words, Bakir was lost in thought for a moment. The old city is Dantalian. He was wearing the skin of Quilty, the head of the Indulgentia family. Quilty, whom Dantalian controlled, was a person with close ties to the Old Testament faction of the religious him Quo Vadis. And the devil who was close friends with Dantalian. Sixth Corpse. If we investigate the Old Testament faction of Quo Vadis, we may be able to find a clue. Even after the Indulgentia family disappeared, the Old Testament faction of Quo Vadis was still issuing and selling indulgences. The sale of indulgences was temporarily halted due to the Dolores 95 Theses incident due to the public's attention. However, as the public began to demand resale, the Old Testament school began issuing indulgences again some time ago. As we welcome the new season, sales of indulgences with new specifications are booming. Surprisingly, there was even a discount event going on. I'm sure it'll be busy as it's been a long-term business. Vikir once again intended to investigate the Old Testament sect of Quo Vadis. You might be able to find clues that are connected to him, perhaps hiding somewhere else entirely other than the Quo Vadis family. That moment. Something similar to an intuition that couldn't be explained logically crossed Vikir's mind. Vikir's gaze turned towards the entrance. There was a poster there that Piggy had dropped on his way out earlier. Mock Investment Competition The flow of the economy was created by humans, but cannot be predicted by human power. However, the intuition of a very small number of geniuses is also in touch with huge trends. If you think you are one of those few, please take note of this poster. This competition is held in what is called the backbone of the economy. It will be the staircase that will lead you to the big stage of the business world. Target, all academy students. Application period, until one week after posters are distributed, posters will naturally expire after one week. Host, Bourgeois Family. Episode 265, Crime Discount Season, 2. The night air was colored with deep blue. 
the cloudy sky looks like a school of sharks rising from the deep sea toward the surface. Splat. 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 The sound of urgent footsteps was echoing in this quiet early morning. A narrow road between red brick buildings. An alley filled with puddles of water. Ha, ha, ha. A man wearing armor under a black trench coat was wiping blood from the corner of his mouth. I would have been left out at this point. Clutching the hatchet at his waist, he stuck his head out of the building and looked left and right. When he saw that the street was empty, he sighed in relief and muttered. Damn it. Miss Ouroboros, if it weren't for that bitch, we would have swallowed the ecliptic. A man muttering as if chewing and spitting out. At that time. Something eerie passed over his head. The man who raised his head was surprised. This is because a man was standing between two buildings, with both feet stretched out, looking down. Black cloak, plague doctor mask. It was the night hound. What, what? You. The man asks upward with a puzzled expression. But the night hound did not answer. However, he only kept his words short. Name Edward Bourbon Jr. Am I right? The man seemed a little taken aback by those words and asked. Who the hell are you? Ouroboros, did that bitch send you? He rolled his eyes for a moment and then shouted again. Oh, no. That bitch always moves alone. So, is that really the night hound? I wonder if the guy she's chasing. Judging from the fact that he was constantly muttering and adjusting his grip on the axe with the hand hidden behind his back, it seemed that he had no intention of giving an easy answer. But the night hound didn't seem to be expecting an answer either. A.K.A. St. Bourbon. Mui is a graduate intermediate level. A high-ranking priest of the new pseudo-religion, Om Church that is quite powerful in the north. He made his first contract with the devil 25 years ago by killing his cousin's sister after molesting her and offering her as a sacrifice. Afterwards, he continued his religious activities and broke up thousands of families by forcing them to donate money. At the end of his life, he joined the demon army and opposed the religious Himquovadis. He used his extensive knowledge and understanding of the scriptures as a weapon to infiltrate the temple as a spy. Afterwards, during the Holy War, he rebelled behind the backs of the Human Alliance and fatally wounded heroes such as Don Quixote La Mancha Tudor and Usher for Bianca. The howling of the night hound eerily heard inside the mask. I asked if that was correct. The man shouted at that question. What are you talking about? The story about being a priest and my cousin is true, but I have no ill will with Don Quixote or the Usher family. But he couldn't finish his sentence. The moment he looks up and opens his mouth. Again. This was because a drop of blood fell from the tip of the night hound's outstretched finger and entered his mouth. Big. For a moment, the man struggled against the bitter taste and disgusting energy that rushed to the tip of his tongue. No matter how much I vomited and strangled myself with both hands, the pain did not go away. It was a poison so vicious that it entangled the root of the tongue and clogged the throat deeply. The man tried to put aura on the axe he pulled from his belt, but the aura soon dissipated into the air. Thud. He fell down and died just a few seconds after a drop of blood entered his mouth. It was a bit meaningless for an expert who was at the intermediate level of a graduate. Hounds of the night. Vikir looked down at the assassination target lying dead in the alley. That guy was the last assassination target of the day, the 19th target. Wait. What did that guy mutter earlier? Vikir recalled the dead man's last words. Damn it. Miss Ouroboros, if it weren't for that bitch, we would have swallowed the ecliptic. Then, is that really the night hound? I wonder if the guy she's chasing. It was a statement that left a lot of room for interpretation. Miss Ouroboros? Was she being chased by that crazy woman? It seems that the prey that Vikir was aiming for was also her target. From the looks of it, Miss Ouroboros also seems to have her own purpose. 1. Confront a mysterious force and hunt down criminals throughout the imperial capital. 2. Wanting to meet the hounds of the night. Bakir recalled a time when he used to hunt gnolls to raise money for tuition. At that time, as soon as he saw my face, he attacked me blindly. 
so I just thought he was psycho. He seems to have a plan of his own. I don't know what the purpose and plan was, but there was a significant overlap between the root and Vakir. Moreover, it seems like the other side really wants to meet this side. Tisk. Vikir clicked his tongue and got down to the floor. When the body of the priest who died after drinking Madame's poison was searched, a crumpled wad of paper was found in his pocket. Indulgence. I forgive all the sins of this faithful church member. This indulgence was issued and guaranteed by the Old Testament faction, and counterfeiting can result in punishment. Indulgences sold by the Old Testament faction of the Quo Vadis family. While all the surfaces were crumpled, only the phrase, we forgive your sins was particularly clean. It is quite ironic that this is a relic left behind by a person who made a contract with the devil and performed the duties of an outsider. At that time. It flies. It flies. It flies. It blooms thickly. A red-hot, inverted pentagram light emanated from Vikir's chest. Decoravia suddenly opened one eye and was looking at the indulgence. The smell of a colleague no. It smells like something that was once a colleague. Not now. Not a colleague. Now I am a complete stranger. No, it is the smell of something that is completely hostile. Decoravia looked at Vakir's gaze and changed his words, wondering if he had missed it. It looked like he was worried that Vakir would pull out his sword again, saying, the devil kills, or, I don't believe in what the devil says. But Vakir was busy thinking about other things and wasn't paying attention to Decoravia. The indulgences smell like the devil, right? Even though the demon, Gabunsi Dantalian, of the Quo Vadis family was eliminated, the smell of the demon did not disappear. Even. Yes. This smell is definitely the smell of, sixth hour. I was always hanging out with my old friend. I also received information that the ninth Sipsanchi, who had already finished hunting a long time ago, was close friends with the sixth Sipsanchi. Good night. I guess I'll have to check out Quo Vadis Street one more time. Vikir nodded and left. And. A few minutes after Vikir left, another long shadow appeared in the alley. Oh. A helmet with two large snake scales sticking out like horns. And shiny black tights and high heels. Ms. Uroboros. A villain whose true identity has never been discovered despite the fierce pursuit of the Imperial Guard, which is lined up with powerful men. She was quietly looking down at the corpses lying around at the end of the alley. Whom I just put up with the annoyance and chased after it hard. Have you already come and gone? She raised her head and looked across the alley. Soon, her eyes, glimpsed through the mask, gently curved. It's rewarding to chase down trash so hard. I have to hurry and follow along. Do you know anything? If I'm lucky, he'll show me his noble side too. Miss Uroboros flew towards the opposite alley. It was in the direction where the walls of the Colossio Academy towered in the distance. The moment when Vikir turns into a dog and comes over the tunnel under the wall. Bar, 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 bar. The sound of the morning horn rang throughout the dormitory. Phew. Vikir returned to his room, exhausted. I slowly opened the door, went in, and sat down on the bed to find Piggy rubbing his eyes. Ah, Vikir. You woke up so early. Vikir had to sit on the bed for a few seconds and then go straight to the playground. All students gather at the playground every morning to do gymnastics and then go to take a bath or eat. Thank goodness today is the weekend. Vikir was relieved that there were no morning lectures. Weekend. Day off. The midterm exams and college league are over, and there is some time left until the final exams. During this short break, students will spend time recharging, take final exams, and then finally enjoy the sweet vacation period called vacation. Vikir went to the bathroom, had a quick wash, and then ate breakfast in the student cafeteria. Afterwards, when I stopped by the newspaper club club room to check last night's news. Wait a minute, professor. That's a notice posted with permission. Please don't take it off. Ho ho ho, it's noisy. Vikir heard the sounds of an argument coming from outside the window. When I opened the door and looked inside to see what was going on, I saw some familiar faces. 
members of the newspaper department, including Dolores. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair were all very angry. And on the other side stood a rather unexpected person. Professor Suddy. She had removed all the posters from the hallway walls and the club room door and was holding them in her hands. The contents of the poster were as follows. Dijabo. In this newspaper club, the part of the newspaper article published on October 0 related to the criminal acts of the Night Hound was referred to as MS, it was corrected and announced to be the work of Ouroboros. This is MS, a copycat of The Hound of the Night. This was an error that occurred because the authorities were unable to recognize the existence of Ouroboros. All members of the newspaper club Ryukian. And now, Professor Suddy has torn up all of these posters related to The Hound of the Night and Miss Ouroboros. Ho ho ho, guys. This week, I am in charge of environmental cleanup. So please stop posting this sloppy trash everywhere. She muttered irritably, sweeping her bangs. Ugh, why do I have to suffer this annoying punishment in the first place? I just ran at the Violent Crime Help and Counseling Center. I guess it became a problem because they provided counseling without distinguishing between victims and perpetrators, right? Dolores pointed out something from the side, but Professor Suddy didn't even seem to listen. Soon, Professor Suddy went out into the hallway, blowing a cold wind. In the meantime, Bakir was quietly hiding behind the locker room, making no noise. He has a deep negative relationship with Professor Suddy due to the left eye incident. There is nothing good about meeting them. Uh. Brother. At that time, Sinclair, who stuck his head out the window, saw Vakir and called out. Did you just see it? Professor Suddy turned it over once and left. The atmosphere in the building is a complete mess. I saw it too. The momentum was fierce. He always had a strange personality, but today it was even worse. Did you cheat on your boyfriend last night? Why is there so much hysteria? Ah, there's no way I could have a boyfriend who would accept that kind of personality in the first place. Bakir nodded in response to Sinclair's grumbling. Eventually, Bakir left the club room, holding the morning newspaper containing the events and incidents of the previous night. Sinclair followed me for a while, asking where I was going, but soon he became sullen and left, saying that he had to practice for a mock investment competition that would be held in the afternoon. The place where Vakir headed was the laboratory of the professor in charge, Morg Banshee. Knock knock. After knocking and opening the door, I heard Professor Banshee's cold voice. Now are you opening the door without answering? You're so arrogant. Attitude score deducted by one point. It was Professor Banshee who noticed that it was Vakir without even looking at the door. I came to cancel my travel permit. Professor Banshee's eyes narrowed at Vakir's words. Out of school. There are all convenient facilities on campus, so why do you want to go out? I'm going to the Rune Church. For repentance. At those words, Li Chai looked young in Professor Banshee's eyes. Hmm. For repentance. Surprisingly. He didn't seem religious enough to go to Mass on the weekend. Professor Banshee, who tilted his head slightly, signed the exit card with a rare expression of satisfaction. Good. That faithful attitude. This is the first time in a while that I like you, Mr. Vakir. However, Vakir, who was accepting the outing pass, had other thoughts beneath his expressionless face. I didn't say I would do it. We go out not to repent, but to make people repent. Episode 266, Crime Discount Season. 3. A quiet weekend morning. Vakir took to the streets. The streets at midday are crowded with people. On the terrace of the cafe, noble ladies or office workers who had met at a business meeting were chatting, and young people were walking around with their arms folded, laughing and talking about what was so fun. As pretty women and handsome men walk busily, the surrounding eyes follow them for a few seconds and then turn to the front again. The scent of flowers at a flower shop, the sweet and savory smell at an egg bread shop. At the railway station in front, where carriages delivering urgent news ran noisily, the sound of hammers announcing expansion work was loud. Suddenly, Bakir stopped for a moment on the outskirts of the street. A narrow alley between red brick buildings. 
At the narrow entrance, there were lines with the Imperial Guard seal indicating that entry was prohibited. This was the place where Vakir carried out the assassination at dawn just a few hours ago. There are two things that have changed. One is that the body has already been removed and is only marked with a white line on the floor. Two of them were deep dents in the floor. Vikir looked at the marks on the floor from afar. A trace as if a snake had passed by. It clearly did not exist at the time of Vikir's assassination. The crowd was buzzing as they looked at the blood stains on the walls and floor. They say someone died there last night. They say he was poisoned after being tortured horribly. Be scared. Is this also the work of the night hounds? No. They say the culprit this time is that woman called Miss Uroboros. What? Was there any other villain other than the night hound? This guy, news is slow. Bakir blended into the crowd and quietly overheard the conversations around him. There was no need to worry as no clues were left behind. It moved in complex movements, sometimes turning into a dog and moving around under narrow terrain, making it absolutely impossible for humans to track it. However, it is a bit surprising that Miss Uroboros came to the place after leaving after finishing work. She's a strange woman. Vikir became even more alert to Miss Uroboros. She has now gone beyond the level of a mere copycat. He is a terrorist with an unknown purpose and seems to be chasing the hounds of the night, so we must keep a close eye on him. But the purpose of going out today was not about Miss Uroboros. Vikir left the crowds and headed toward the center, wearing one of his hats. There are so many people. Vikir was impressed when he arrived at the Yoke Land, the bustling city of the imperial capital. There are so many people that it feels like looking at a dense bowl of bean sprouts. Even if I blend in, no one will know. Vikir thought that if you want to hide a tree, hide it in the forest. Vikir blended in with the direction of the crowd and moved forward naturally. Soon, the white shield, the holy symbol that announces the Quo Vadis family, is seen. This magnificent and splendid temple was managed by a branch of the Old Testament sect. I saw many people standing in line in front of the entrance to the temple. And a priest dressed in white shouts loudly into his horn. Ruler. Repent. Special discount today only. This is a golden opportunity to have your sins forgiven at half price. Come on, this opportunity doesn't come around every day. Misdemeanors are half price today. Felony crimes are accepted at a 30% DC discount. Since a really big crime is a crime, please ask the bishop for advice now, indulgences, indulgences. Special sale today only. Buy now and get even more tax benefits. This is a discount promotion that starts tomorrow and we don't know when it will happen again. The shouts of priests selling indulgences were mixed with the calls of cotton candy sellers selling cotton candy, corn sellers selling roasted corn, and bubble sellers selling bubble toys for children. People coming out of the temple come out with bright expressions and walk with brisk steps. They were all people who had bought indulgence. A couple's conversation reached Vakir's ears. Ugh. I bought indulgences this time and I feel relieved. I've been scolded all this time because of guilt. Ah, because you were drinking and driving a carriage and hit a child. Ha. Huh. Because of that, I couldn't sleep properly until now, but I came to repent when I heard that indulgences were greatly discounted. But didn't that little girl die? Have you given an apology and compensation to the bereaved family? No. Didn't you? You bought indulgence. I bought a really expensive one, so wouldn't it be okay? But. What? That's it then. Anyway, he says he's really nice. Vikir turned his head and looked at the man and woman for a moment. It doesn't smell like the devil. They were not those who made a pact with the devil. Surprisingly. However, similar types of people were overflowing here in the imperial capital. Right now, in this branch of the Old Testament faction of the House of Quovadis, numerous people were lining up to buy indulgences, and on the other side, people who had bought indulgences were lining up. If you think that these people are all people who committed sins and that those people were all forgiven for their sins, it becomes dizzying. I wonder why the world is like this. Vikir shook his head with the sigh that older people usually make. We were doing our best to prevent the era of destruction from coming, 
but somehow that task feels even more heavy today. Yet. Vikir also joined the end of the long line and waited for a long time to enter the temple. As I passed between the large, clean white stone pillars that made it hard to tell how much money was spent, and went deep inside, I saw neatly dressed priests. Hello. What sin have you committed? Is there a separate indulgence you are looking for? A priest approached Vikir. The fact that he still looks young makes it seem like he doesn't have much experience. The priest clung to Vikir and explained various things that were not even asked. There are indulgences for misdemeanors. Of course, there are also indulgences for serious crimes. There are also special indulgences suitable for extreme crimes worthy of the death penalty, the customer, or rather, the believer, looks young, so he couldn't have committed such a serious crime. Could it be a misdemeanor? Bikir asked the priest who was struggling to come up with a customized estimate for indulgences. If we can repent of sins we committed in the past, is it possible to repent in advance of sins we will commit in the future? Then the priest smiled brightly, as if saying yes. Anything is possible if you purchase indulgences in advance. What crime are you planning to commit? It is truly an enormous crime. The priest's expression hardened at Bikir's words. How will the priest react to a person who predicts a huge crime to be committed in the future? Eventually, the priest with a serious expression spoke in a serious voice as expected. What is it? Hmm. In the case of extreme crimes, the price of indulgence would be very high. Are you okay? If you have the means, I will bring the bishop. Oh, first, would you like to go to the VVIP-only chapel over there and have a cup of tea while waiting? Instead of dissuading a person who predicts that he or she will commit a crime in the future, he or she is only giving an estimate. And that too in a tone that seems to suggest a promotional product. As Vikir laughed, the priest asked again carefully. But how serious is this sin that you seek such an expensive indulgence? Then Vikir answered. I think I'm going to kill one of my neighbor's pigs. Moment. The priest tilted her head as if she had heard wrong. Pig one, that's a heinous crime. Yes. Pigs are also life. After all, isn't taking life a sin? Then the priest took a deep sigh. He glanced at the long line of people behind him and then turned his head back to Vikir. Hey. Now the words are short. Just go. Ha. Huh. Nevertheless, as Vikir stood still and did not move, the priest roughly tore a piece of indulgence paper in his arms and stamped it with his own stamp. Okay. I'm giving it to you because it's amazing that we came this far with just one pig's life. Thank you. Okay. Next time, don't sin. Live a good life. The priest took a deep sigh and placed the roughly scribbled indulgence on Vikir's hand. Vikir raised his head and said. Money. Tisk, that's enough, man. The priest clicked his tongue and suddenly put his hand into Vikir's pocket. Then he took out a coin from among the rattling coins. It was a one gold gold coin containing a trace amount of gold in copper. It went into the offering box that the priest wore around his neck. Tongarang. Yes, you have been repented. The priest's regular comment was heard in a deep voice. That was the end of it. Vikir left the temple. In his hand was a small indulgence. Indulgence. I forgive all the sins of this faithful church member. This indulgence was issued and guaranteed by the Old Testament faction, and counterfeiting can result in punishment. Is it like this? Vikir gathered the information he saw, heard, and felt when he entered the temple. The demonic energy hovering inside, a faint but distinct smell. I can definitely feel the energy of number six. It's still faint, though. The decorabia on his chest was also saying the same thing, sniffing its non existent nose. Vikir followed the rotten smell emanating from the sixth corpse and came out onto the main road again. It's not in this temple, but it's definitely related. The emperor must be somewhere. Just as Vikir was about to turn his back on the temple and return to the academy. Suddenly, a familiar face caught my eye. Eek. Vikir hurriedly put on his bread hat and went to the side of the pillar. Even though he was wearing a deep hood, he was able to recognize Vikir, who had a sharp eye. Dolores. 
Her face was seen as she quietly walked into the temple, looking around with suspicious movements. Episode 267, Crime Discount Season, 4 Dolores Room Quo Vadis She left the dormitory before afternoon and visited an Old Testament temple here. If I do this, I won't get caught, right? His entire body, including his face, was covered with a black hood and cape. Traveling in secret. The intention was to look at the temple as an ordinary person, not as a saint. Dolores moved through the crowd in a manner that seemed suspicious to anyone and hid in the darkest corner of the temple. Good. It was perfect. However, Dolores' outfit only stood out because of the all-white floors, walls, and pillars. The only one who doesn't know it is himself. The purpose of her visit to the Old Testament temple today was quite complicated. The current situation of the religious in Quo Vadis is chaos itself, and due to the intense conflict between the Old Testament and New Testament factions, there is no time to pay attention to every corner of the empire, and as a result, heretics and pseudo-religions are rampant here and there. Dolores had come on a field trip to solve this problem. Her normally serious expression became even more serious today. Now that I think about it, a similar problem came up in the second game of the college league, right? She recalled Quo Vadis quest that she saw in the college league not long ago. Slash difficulty three stars and a half. Currently, the empire is suffering from the ever-increasing evils of heresy and sects. At this time, from the perspective of the Quo Vadis Inquisition, please suggest a way to eradicate heretics and cults and raise the status of the Rune Church. Contents related to the Inquisition of the Quo Vadis family. I thought it was a quest prepared by heretic Inquisitor Mosgus, but it was a task that reached a higher level than that. For reference, the person who wrote the answer to this question was Sinclair, a first-year student. I said that the Pope himself read Sinclair's answer. Dolores later visited Sinclair and asked him. What was presented as an answer to that problem and how did it receive recognition from the Pope? But Sinclair just smiled and avoided answering. Hey, it wasn't a big deal. In the end, it was rejected because it was too extreme. Still, I barely passed because I was recognized for its originality. Ehe dash. Dolores swallowed heavily. In order to get rid of heresy and pseudo-believers, the Old Testament and the New Testament factions have no choice but to reconcile and join hands, or one of them disappears altogether. Or, strike out heretics and pseudo-believers all at once. But the latter is impossible. So Dolores came to investigate the Old Testament faction, the root cause of all these problems. If Dolores, a saint from the New Testament faction, came, it was obvious that she would act in a show-off manner, so I had no choice but to go undercover to investigate. There are so many people. Dolores muttered as she looked at the long line of people that circled the temple several times. Compared to the New Testament temples, there are much more people in the Old Testament temples. The amount of donations collected was also on a different level. I originally knew that the Indulgentia family had a large share in the donations coming into the Old Testament faction I guess that wasn't quite the case. Even though the Indulgentia family, which was a subordinate family, disappeared, the financial resources of the Old Testament faction were still intact. How is it that the Old Testament faction maintains its wealth even though Quilty, or rather Dantalian, is dead? By simply selling indulgences? Is that really all it is? Although there are many people lining up to buy indulgences, most of them are small buyers. You don't see people who have committed extreme crimes or who can pay large sums of money. Well, of course. There is no way that people who would spend a lot of money to buy indulgences would come to the temple in broad daylight. Even if they did come, it made no sense to send a representative or make a deal in writing, and to visit in person. Then where do the high-ranking priests of the Old Testament faction get their vips from? Line of funds. That's exactly what Dolores was curious about. Right then. A large, colorful carriage stopped at the corner of the temple. The white shield symbol, which is the symbol of Quo Vadis, can be seen shining brightly with oil. Eventually, a tall, middle-aged man got off the carriage and smiled as he received cheers from the crowd. Dolores paused when she saw him. The person she finds most unpleasant in this world has appeared. Humbert Humbert El Quovadis. A man who holds the position of cardinal, 
which is practically the highest dignity leading the Old Testament faction and is a position so high that there is no position higher than that of the Pope. At the same time, the father of Saint Dolores. Ironically, Dolores was afraid of her father. It has been like this ever since she became his adoptive daughter a long time ago, just because she was born with divine powers. Especially before going to bed, when I went to say hello, when his gaze swept over my body, I felt as if my whole body was wrapped around a snake. Ha! Huh. Dolores felt her heart sink and pressed her back against the stone pillar. Let's just stay like this. If you hold your breath and stay still, Humbert won't look this way. But her wish did not come true. Hmm. Humbert was a keen man. He sensed the gaze that was momentarily and intensely focused on him and turned his gaze towards it. Wait a minute, Lieutenant. There's a place that bothers me, so I'll just take a quick look around before entering the temple. He raised his hand to the adjutant following him and walked towards the stone pillar. Tap tap, tap tap, tap tap. Wherever Humbert steps, a path appears. Each of the rune believers took off their hats, bowed their heads, and cleared the way for Humbert. Dolores felt her heart pounding as if it would explode. Humbert's footsteps keep getting closer. Every time, it felt like a large snake was squeezing my heart. The feeling of nervousness reminds me of the moment when I almost ran into Quilty in the hallway. However, there is no good male junior who helped her at that time. It was just temporary luck. Dolores swallowed dry saliva. Just as she was desperately thinking of an excuse to make in front of Humbert. Oh my! Who is this? There were two people blocking Humbert. Both were men with their faces covered by white hoods and robes. Humbert's expression frowned slightly. Who? Oops. Look at my mind. He 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 he, this is with your face covered. Then, with a cheerful laugh, the white hood came off. The face revealed is an old face that shows that it has gone through a lot of hardship. He was an elderly man between an uncle and a grandfather. A person with a warm appearance and a rather short build that can be seen everywhere. But when Humbert saw him, he couldn't help but stiffen his face. It's been a while since I last saw you. Cardinal Luther. The only cardinal in the religious him quo vadis. The two most powerful figures who assist immediately below the Pope. One was Humbert and the other was this man right in front of me. Martin Luther L. Quovadis. A priest of great standing who came here from a poor and narrow pioneer temple on the far outskirts. The leader of the New Testament faction. Humbert's biggest rival. He is Cardinal Martin Luther. Behind him, Archbishop Mosgus, a large man who also belonged to the New Testament faction, stood with his back straight. Humbert asked politely, with a friendly smile on his face. Cardinal Luther, what brings you here? He he he, I came to spy on you. Yes. When Humbert asked with a hard expression, Luther chuckled. Our temple is always full of flies, but the temples that Cardinal Humbert tours are always crowded with believers, so I have to be able to endure this. Ha ha ha, so, despite my shame, I came here to gain some know-how. Humbert could only force a smile as Luther spoke in a friendly tone. Is there any reason why there are so many believers? It's just that it's a good place and has a large population. Haha, <laughs> is that so? This really teaches me something again. I guess it's all my fault. Unlike Humbert, Martin Luther's method of proselytizing was quite unique. He rarely preached doctrine or gave sermons. However, while visiting the old, sick, and poor, he always said the following. If you're hungry and tired, come visit me anytime. If you suddenly feel sick or feel weak, come visit us at any time. If you need someone to sincerely congratulate you on your wedding day, come by any time. If you need someone to truly grieve at a funeral, come visit me at any time. If something is really sad and you want to cry or complain, come visit me any time, any time. If you can't sleep because your house is too cold or humid, come visit us any time. If you need to lift something heavy or do something else, please come by any time. Besides, please come visit me any time. They never say things like how many times you have read the Bible, whether you have memorized all the lyrics of a hymn, why you should evangelize to your neighbors, come to the temple regularly, make an offering, etc. 
Just come to the room of an elderly person living alone in the morning and evening to see if the floor is warm or not windy, go to the sick child and see how much fever they have and if they have eaten, go to the sick person and see if there is any need for help, etc. Martin Luther and the New Testament priests under him always seem somehow sloppy and lacking. A life where you can barely eat and barely wear clothes. He was the exact opposite of the Old Testament priests with their sophisticated appearance, speech, and well-dressed clothes. Of course, the biggest difference is the amount of donations collected. Humbert half bowed his head towards Luther in front of him. Then I have a meeting, so I'll stop. Oh my gosh, this old man took up too much of a precious person's time. Then Luther also bowed his head with a smile and made the sign of the cross on his forehead. When Humbert turned around in a polite manner and was about to walk away, Luther suddenly recited a verse from the Bible. This land is infested with demons and is trying to devour us. Humbert stopped in his tracks when he heard those words. Behind him, Luther continued speaking. Don't be afraid and stand still. We will overcome with the truth. A large crowd of people who had gathered to buy indulgences were watching the two. Facing the crowd, Luther continued speaking. Even if my relatives, wealth, honor, and life are all taken away. Humbert remains silent and does not look back. Luther ended his speech in a gentle but firm manner. The truth will live and make the empire eternal. Run men. It was certainly unusual for two of the most powerful figures in the religious him quo vadis to meet in one place on the same day. A large crowd of people gathered to see this noisy incident, and Dolores was able to take advantage of the gap and escape safely. Dolores, who hid herself in the corner of the temple to avoid Humbert's gaze, tilted her head with a sigh of relief. Why did Cardinal Luther come here? Martin Luther has become increasingly rare in public appearances recently. Dolores is already worried that the Pope's dementia symptoms are getting worse as he gets older. She was very dissatisfied with the contrasting actions of Humbert, who was recently increasing his external activities, and Martin Luther, who was reducing his external activities. I need to be more active, even if it's on my own. That is the way to make the public aware of the existence of the New Testament faction. Dolores thought so. But unlike the ideal, reality is difficult. Dolores was still only a student, and although being a saint was only superficial, she had little real power. It is inevitable to keep having the gloomy thought that you can't do anything on your own. If only he were around. Suddenly, Dolores remembered a certain face. A person who is reassuring just by being with him. The person who made me feel like I wanted to lean on and rely on for the first time in my life. And also, for the first time in his life, he was someone who wanted others to lean on him. The Hound of the Night. I felt confident that I could accomplish anything with him, no matter how hard and difficult it was. In fact, didn't they even join forces to defeat the fearsome demon king? I didn't think there would be anything difficult if I was with him. If the night hound was by my side, I wouldn't be afraid of the Old Testament faction, heretics, cults, or Humbert. Miss you. Dolores honestly admitted her feelings. Maybe it was the first time it had happened. However, the way to meet him is long. Maybe he has already forgotten himself. Just once, that night at daycare. It might have ended in just a one-night stand. Ha! Dolores couldn't even think of stopping the sigh that escaped her mind. Right then. Is it this way? An unfamiliar voice came from behind the stone pillar. When Dolores, startled, turns her head behind the pillar, she sees a man with a familiar face walking towards her. It was Humbert's adjutant. Before entering the temple, the persistent Humbert sent his lieutenants to chase after the gaze he had felt earlier. Uh, what should I do? Dolores was very embarrassed and looked around her head. But this is a dead end, so there is no way out. In the end, it was inevitable that he would be caught by his lieutenant. Soon, Humbert's adjutant walked quickly and stuck his head out behind the innermost stone pillar. And. As expected, there is no one. The Cardinal too. I heard you become much more sensitive these days. The adjutant immediately shook his head and went back. And above the adjutant's head. Dolores was struggling on the side of a stone pillar several meters away from the ground. Yup yup yup. Dolores looked away, very embarrassed. 
A man holding Dolores' waist with one hand and tightly covering her mouth with the other. A man wearing a black dog mask that is commonly sold on the street and that children would play with can be seen standing close to a stone pillar. The tough, seemingly invisible wire was easily supporting the weight of the two people. Dolores recalled a past memory from the rough hand covering her mouth. It's definitely been like this before. In the past, when I encountered Quilty in the hallway, he was dragged into the locker room by his strong hands. I think I had a similar feeling back then. The cure. So, without realizing it, Dolores asked. But the answer that came back was something completely different. Shoo. A low growling voice. A hoarse, hurt-filled voice. The mask changed, but the momentum and atmosphere remained the same. Hounds of the Night. He came to see Dolores. Episode 268, The Holy Body, 1. The Face of a Cute Black Puppy. Vikir was now wearing a children's mask sold at a street vendor. As it is urgent, it is the night hound stopgap mode. And Dolores was standing in front of Vikir. With a blank face, as if he couldn't tell if this was a dream or reality. Night hound. Nod. Vikir nodded to Dolores' question. Thump thump thump. Dolores felt her heart pounding at the sudden meeting. He acted as if he had the supernatural power to see into people's minds. Just now, the moment I thought I wanted to see it, didn't it appear before my eyes like a lie? Unless it's because of superpowers. So what is it? Is it fate? A common theme in popular classic romance novels. But Dolores, who was precocious for her age, thought all of that was childish. But when you're in this situation, you can't help but think about it. A fateful opponent. Inevitable relationship. Well, things like that that make my heart pound. Well, come to think of it, even back then. Dolores recalled a moment in the past when she was briefly assimilated into the spirit of the Nighthound. A cold, lonely, and difficult journey. A pilgrim walking through a thorny path carrying all his burdens alone. Memories of that night when I could get a glimpse of his pain, pain, and numb loneliness. A soulmate who went through extreme situations together. Even though he doesn't know anything about the outer shell, there is definitely an invisible tie between him and himself. She thought so. At that time. Come to your senses. The voice of the night hound brought her back to her senses. I quickly looked ahead and saw the palm of the night hound moving back and forth in front of my eyes. Oh. Sorry. I was dazed for a moment. I was a little surprised. Dolores blushed and made an excuse. Eventually, she looked at the night hound with the cute puppy face and made a bewildered expression. What can I say? The atmosphere has changed a bit. It's the same with the mask. Bikir didn't answer, but smart Dolores already noticed. This meeting was unplanned by the night hound. So, isn't it so busy that you can't even prepare a mask? I guess we met by chance. Do you live around here? Bikir continued to remain silent, but Dolores knew that she was interpreting it as a positive meaning. The fact that we met while looking around in casual clothes over the weekend means that there is a residence nearby. Moreover, judging by the fact that you know the geography of the Colosio Academy well. In the past, it was thought that the Night Hound had an informant within the school. However, looking at the current situation, the possibility that he was a person inside the school could not be ruled out. Wait for a sec. But why did I say that earlier? Dolores had just inadvertently mentioned the name Vikir. What is the reason? Simply because of a hand covering your mouth. Reminds me of the time I almost ran into Quilty in the hallway of the orphanage. Dolores felt a familiar sense of deja vu from somewhere but I don't know exactly what it is. I just have a vague feeling that I'm missing something important. Meanwhile, Vikir was quietly watching the back of the adjutant who was leaving. What was faintly emanating from him was clearly the scent of the devil. Even though Dantalian has been eliminated, the members of the Quo Vadis family still smell of the devil. As confirmed when purchasing indulgences, that smell is also present throughout the Old Testament temple. And Humbert, whom I had seen earlier from afar, also had a strong smell. There was no smell from the New Testament priests of the Quo Vadis family. 
If so, there must be a connection between the Old Testament faction and the Sixth Corps. In particular, Humbert, the head of the Old Testament faction, was a suspicious person in many ways. The carriages they ride and the mansions they live in are decorated with all kinds of precious metals and works of art, and the expenditures are also enormous. Even though it was revealed that he regularly received entertainment and bribes from Quilty of Indulgentiaga, he was also a seasoned politician who survived by cutting his tail. But he wasn't a devil. Although he seems to be deeply intertwined with the devil, he is not the devil. No matter how carefully I looked, the conclusion was the same every time. Then I guess I'll have to look into his new source of funds. Humbert still boasts wealth despite the extinction of the Indulgentia family. If we find out where he gets the money from, we might be able to find the sixth corpse who is close friends with the ninth corpse. And Vikir found a clue in Dolores' words. It is said that heresies and cults are running rampant throughout the empire due to the conflict between the Old Testament and New Testament factions. So I tried to find a solution. Dolores revealed the reason she came to spy on the Old Testament temple. And Vikir reacted to the words, heresy, and pseudo. Confrontation between the Old and New Testaments. Are they the ones who benefit the most from it? At that moment, the target of assassination not long ago appeared in Vikir's mind. The name is Edward Bourbon Jr., also known as Saint Bourbon. Mui is a graduate intermediate level. A high-ranking priest of the new religion Om, which is quite powerful in the north. He is a traitor who betrays the human union and joins the demon army in the war of destruction that will take place decades later. If it were his original fate, he would have seriously injured Tudor and Bianca and run away, but Vakir killed him in advance to eliminate any future worries. And the, indulgence discovered as a relic of a dead pseudo-priest. Indulgence. I forgive all the sins of this faithful church member. This indulgence was issued and guaranteed by the Old Testament faction, and counterfeiting can result in punishment. After doing some background research, Bakir was able to obtain quite meaningful results. There is a high possibility that the new source of funds for the Old Testament faction is a cult or heresy. There was a possibility that the Old Testament faction was spreading religious autonomy in the form of indulgences to gain an advantage in competition with the New Testament faction. Perhaps because he noticed this to some extent, Cardinal Martin Luther also visited this place today. Dolores, who heard Vicar's words, was surprised and covered her mouth with her hand. Oh my God! I didn't know Cardinal Luther was even watching. I really was a frog in a well. This is not the time to blame yourself. There was a high possibility that pseudo-cults and heretics were just the tale of the story. At best, they are intermediate filters that distribute and launder funds. The real is behind the scenes. Old Testament school of religious him quo vadis. And heresies and cults are rampant throughout the empire. And a chain of funds leading to an unidentified dark shadow. In order for quo vadis to be purified, this flow of dirty money must be stopped. First, it's time to knock on the middle links first. Dolores nodded at Vakir's words. What kind of outside force is trying to corrupt and control Quo Vadis? And that too quietly, using a worldly weapon called money. When heresy and pseudo-believers run rampant, those who suffer the most are the struggling and poor. Dolores continued speaking indignantly. I don't want people to believe in runes. As long as each person can achieve peace of mind by doing good to others in a comfortable and familiar way, he or she can be saved without having to go through religion. But they're not. They. Vikir was also well aware of the harmful effects of heresy and pseudo-believers. At a time when the conflict with the devil was in full swing, I saw many vermin-like creatures wandering among the poor and sick, sucking their blood. Money, food, body, blood, appetite, lust, pleasure, etc. Most of the things that heretics and cults demand from believers are obvious. The guy I killed yesterday was a similar case. Dolores was shocked for a moment by Vakir's words. As expected, the night hounds were fighting. Still alone, lonely, painful. Please let me help too. Dolores held the night hound's hand tightly. It was like that before, but now it was even stronger and more earnest. Come on. A light of respect and affection that could not be hidden was radiating from Dolores' eyes, which strongly demanded solidarity. I might be able to help. 
In response to her strong conviction, Bakir asked just in case. The buff from the last Dantalian match. Can we do it again? That is. Dolores quickly looked intimidated. I guess it was only a temporary phenomenon at the time, and it seemed like I couldn't control that power at will yet. But. If that were the case, she would have already been called the Iron-Blooded Saint. Vikir nodded. Dolores today is still just a young girl. There is still a long way to go before he awakens and becomes a great hero who will save all mankind. You shouldn't expect too much. I understand first. First of all, we need to look into the heretics and cults that are presumed to be connected to the Old Testament faction. Uh, how? Are you going to visit every single place in the empire? At those words, Bakir shook his head. There is no time to do that. There is a way to overcome everything. Capable of eradicating all heresies and cults existing in the empire with one blow. Dolores' eyes widened when she heard that such a method existed. This is a problem that young New Testament priests could not solve even though they put their heads together and thought about it countless times. So, the answer everyone was giving up on. The Night Hound said this quite firmly and in a confident tone. Well, what is that? Dolores asked with sparkling eyes. As expected from an honor student, he had a pen and notebook in his hands and was ready to take notes. Yet. Vikir opened his mouth in a dry, voiceless voice. I need your body. Episode 269, The Holy Body, 2. The saint's body is called the Holy Host, which is often used to mean white bread and white wine. Therefore, the priests of Rune would eat white bread and white wine once a week on the weekend. It was a custom that originated from the myth that a long time ago, the prophet Rune made white bread from his own flesh and white wine from his blood and distributed them to his believers. And those who copied or cleverly twisted the doctrines of the Rune Church also generally had similar cultures. For example, the New World Church, Om Church, and Manson Church, which are rapidly growing in power throughout the empire. They copied and used Rune's old doctrines almost exactly, but added their own unique interpretations to the empty parts of the doctrines, ultimately creating a completely new religion. And the highest-ranking priests, including Elmanee, O.M., and Charles, the heads of these large-scale heresies and pseudo-religions, were now gathered in one place. Right on the outskirts of the ecliptic, Quo Vadis, where there were few people, was in front of a temple of the New Testament sect. Many people gathered together and started talking. Oh my, it's been a while, priest. Has your face improved a lot? What? This time, I received a donation of all my assets from a merchant guild, which made my living situation a little easier. Okay. You are also very resourceful. How did you receive the donation? Is there anything special? The guild leader's daughter there had been sick for several years, and I tricked her into saying I would treat her, so I took it all out. If you're in pain, all it takes is a few narcotic painkillers. Ha ha ha, that's amazing. I keep losing weight in my face, so I'm worried that it might make me look too thin. Isn't it because you brought in a new young concubine this time? Aha, uh -huh, that's right. I originally had a separate husband, but he gently seduced me with doctrine and made me fall in love with him. Well done. To put it bluntly, wouldn't he be a true god if he sacrificed not only all his wealth but also his body and soul for us? You're right. Otherwise, salvation is a difficult task. Heresy and pseudo-priests had different religious principles and principles, but they had one thing in common. It was to gain weight by taking the backbone of those who were tired and struggling. At that time, the crowd split to left and right, and three figures walked out from different directions. The heads of heretics and pseudo-religions were Elmanee, O.M., and Charles. Elmanee, who was old but still had a greedy glow in her eyes, opened her mouth. By the way, the fact that the New Testament sect of Quo Vadis sent a dinner invitation means that they will finally recognize our New World denomination as an official tribe, right? Then, O.M., a man so fat that he almost looked like a ball, spoke. You're right. The Eucharist is the act of sharing and eating the blood and flesh of a saint. Calling us here probably means that we want to form a formal alliance with our church. Charles, who had a thin build and wide eyes, also nodded. That's right. 
The reason we decided to gather in secret today was to keep the Old Testament faction in check. When they learned that we had been providing funds to the Old Testament faction for a long time, they also wanted to get something out of it. The leaders of the heresies and cults gathered here all call themselves the Pope. They gathered here for different reasons after receiving a dinner invitation secretly delivered by Quo Vadis in the name of the New Testament school some time ago. Since they have already established a strong relationship with the Old Testament faction, they now plan to join the New Testament faction as well. Currently, within Quo Vadis, the Old Testament faction and the New Testament faction are in fierce conflict, so if we provide military funds to both, wouldn't we be able to survive no matter which of the two wins? You're right. A clever rabbit digs multiple burrows. No matter who the final winner is, we just have to enjoy the reflected benefits. Perhaps it would be better for us if the two were at odds forever, with no difference between victory and defeat. In order to do so, our gathering here today must be kept completely secret from the outside world. So as not to fall into the ears of the Old Testament faction. I'm sure you all kept your secret well, right? Heresies and cults of great influence from all over the empire have gathered here. The leaders of each religion only lead the core high-ranking officials that they can truly trust. How fortunate are we that the New Testament bastards have now come to their senses and reached out to us. They don't either. Without our financial support, they will never be able to defeat the Old Testament faction. Ha ha ha, New Testament bastards. They always pretend to be noble and clean. They came secretly under the cover of night and hurried into the temple so that no one would see them. No, I was trying to go in. Quack. If it weren't for the heavy drinking that came out of nowhere. Rumble. Woojijijijik. The remains of collapsed buildings and street trees covered carriages and people. Screams began to arise everywhere. W. Watt. Heretics and cults surround the area in a circle, panicking as they see the collapsed soil and debris. And in the thick dust, a single footsteps was heard. Togak, Togak, Togak. Black tights, tall heels over 30 centimeters. Ms. Uroboros. She appeared here out of nowhere. Ho 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 what is it? Why is there so much trash? She looked around at the priests and shrugged her shoulders. I came here after hearing that the night hound had appeared. Is it just a bunch of stinking trash? Then the priests shouted in anger. You look like an arrogant criminal bitch. What are you doing? Kill it. Soon, soldiers armed with spears and shields rushed towards Miss Uroboros. However. Shiririk, Kirik. The whip, coiled like a snake, cut into pieces the soldiers' arms, legs, and torsos as if they were cutting zucchini. A terrifying aura flies in, drawing a purple and black trajectory. Sigh, wow. Quack. A slight earthquake occurred every time a whip with thorns sprouting like a rose vine struck the hard rock floor. As the paladins armed with heavy armor were almost crushed to death, the faces of the heretics and cult leaders turned pale. No way. What kind of monster is that? Hike. What are the Imperial Guards doing? Help me. I am a person who should not die in a place like this. Elmani, ORM, and Charles tried to run away, but it was impossible. This is because Miss Uroboros has already landed lightly in front of them. She asked in a tone full of laughter. What are you guys? Is it the Pope? Then all three nodded. I am the Pope of the New World Church. Do you think you can avoid heaven's punishment by doing this to me? I am the leader of the Ohm Church. If I were to have an accident, there would be hundreds of thousands of believers who would be sad. I am the god of Mansonism. Anyone who wants to harm me will definitely suffer harm. Elmani, ORM, and Charles spoke in stern tones. Okay. Wow. Match. Pow. Miss Uroboros cracked her whip in the air. Soon, several of the trees that had been uprooted and fallen down changed their appearance due to the aura, taking on the shape of trees with numerous branches extending out. Elmani, O.M., and Charles tilted their heads. Okay. Miss Uroboros said with a coquettish smile. If you are the Pope or God, show me the proof. Then I will save your life. At the same time. Whirling. 
Miss Ouroboros' whip wrapped around the body of Charles, who was at the front. Ha! Huh. Charles, who was standing blankly, was instantly dragged to the huge tree in front of him. Yet. Puff puff puff. Miss Ouroboros threw a dagger from her belt, piercing both his shoulders and thighs and nailing him to the tree. Quaya. Charles was screaming and shaking like crazy, but his body had already been nailed to the tree. Miss Ouroboros said with a smile. Now, I'll put a laurel wreath on you too. A whip studded with poisonous thorns wrapped around Charles's head, which was fluttering furiously from side to side. Ugh. Wook. Charles struggled violently, blood spurting out from all over his body, and soon fell limp. He died of shock due to excessive bleeding. Next to him, Elmani and O.M. were lying naked and urinating. Miss Ouroboros opened her mouth brightly. Yes, participant number one. You have failed in resurrection. Then it's participant number two's turn next. Miss Ouroboros walked in front of O.R.M., who was trembling. And. Pow. Pop. I lifted the heel of my high heel and stamped his toe, shattering it into pieces. Kuyikik. Kahak. O.M. struggled, but Miss Ouroboros did not stop kicking. Starting from the toes, to the top of the foot, ankle, shin, knee, and thigh. Soon, O.R.M.'s lower body was completely crushed into a rag. Miss Ouroboros said with a smile. The next challenge is, fixing a cripple. Come on, stand up on your own two legs. Then I will save your life. But O.M. couldn't wake up. But. Say, please save me. Me, I am not God. Not even a priest. Just a pseudo. No, it's a heresy, a heresy. He just begs for his life, spitting out the truth, perhaps for the first time in his life. No way. The Pope is dying. How could our Savior show himself like that to a mere mob? Hey, this is a scam. He knows how to urinate, but he has no divine power whatsoever. The priests and believers who have been obeying the authority of the leaders all scream in disbelief. Meanwhile, Elmani, the leader of the largest cult, was glaring at Miss Ouroboros with a stern expression. I, I am not afraid of you. I will never give in. Because I am a god who has returned to this world. Oh. Okay. Miss Ouroboros laughed, covering her mouth with her hand. Eventually, she seemed interested and asked Elmani. If you are really a god, you won't mind if you touch holy water, right? What? Of course. But Elmani could not answer. As soon as he opened his mouth, Miss Ouroboros took out a bottle in her arms and sprayed the liquid it contained on Elmani's face. Ruler. It's holy water. Miss Ouroboros smiled brightly. At the same time, a terrifying sound began to come from Elmani's face. Washishishishishishik. The flesh melts and the blisters boil. The horrible smell of burning flesh began to sting my nose. Kwa haheya. Elmani struggled, covering his face with both hands. However, the holy water had already melted the flesh and created countless holes in the bones, as well as burned everything inside them. Oh. Did you accidentally pour hydrochloric acid instead of holy water? Miss Ouroboros narrowed her eyes and hit her head with her fist. The faces of the other religious leaders turned white as they saw Elmani dying in terrible pain. I I am not the second coming of Rune. Help me. I just like it when people support me. Ugh. I just created a religion so I could commit adultery with married men and married women. Ugh. I just made it for business. Let's make some money. Shocking confessions from religious leaders follow. And the believers were also shocked. Clink, clang, clap, clap. The sound of trust being broken and collapsing was heard everywhere. Um. Things are going a little differently than planned. On the roof of the New Testament temple. Vikir, in nighthound mode, was looking down at the tragic scene below with Dolores. Vikir's original plan was to gather the leaders of heretics and cults in one place and exterminate them. In fact, this was Sinclair's original plan. In the past, Sinclair was given the following mission in the second game of the College League. 
slash difficulty three stars and a half. Currently, the Empire is suffering from the ever-increasing evils of heresy and sects. At this time, from the perspective of the Quo Vadis Inquisition, please suggest a way to eradicate heretics and cults and raise the status of the Rune Church. At that time, Sinclair came up with a rather radical answer, and it was this. A plan that Sinclair will reveal to Dolores a long time later. Vikir already knew this through his memories before returning. Heresies and pseudo-believers are like weeds, you cannot catch them unless you pull them out by the roots. However, since we cannot dispose of all the grass seeds scattered everywhere, the only solution is to collect them in one place and set them on fire. Of course, this does not include indigenous folk beliefs or traditional religions of indigenous people, etc., which do not cause harm to those around them. It only targets scum who take advantage of the hearts of the poor and exhausted, who extort wealth, do cruel things to children, and covet other people's husbands and wives. Vikir sent Madame Young to steal the handwriting of Martin Luther, a New Testament bishop. Madame Young spewed out thread in the shape of the letters written on the documents in Luther's office, solidified it, and when she pulled it off, she was able to steal not only the contents of the documents but also the handwriting. Meanwhile. Well, isn't that too extreme? Dolores was trembling slightly. However, that is a plan that Dolores, that a saint of steel, will carry out only a dozen years later. Accordingly, Bakir answered without much emotion. Look what these dying cultists are spewing out. Dolores' eyes widened at those words. Phew. The blood spouted by dying people. The color of the blood was dark black. All of the high-ranking executives and passionate believers here had made a contract with the devil. Whether you knew it or not. I knew it. They were related to Sixth City. Bikir thought as he looked at the people who were dying in the hands of Miss Uroboros. To be honest, I wasn't sure that Miss Uroboros would show up here. Half and half. It was a 50% probability. This made it clear. 1. Uroboros wants to meet the Hound of the Night. 2. Uroboros has a hostile relationship with the Devil's minions, reason unknown. Wherever the Night Hound had appeared so far, Miss Uroboros had always appeared, as if following. So, this time, Bakir planned to become a copycat of Miss Uroboros. Because cross-dressing and a certain level of whipping aren't that difficult. But things got faster because Miss Uroboros really came. Timely. This way. I hear you screaming. All forces charge. We'll catch him this time. The sound of the Imperial Guards who had been dispatched after receiving the report was heard rushing in. Ho ho ho, does this feel like I've been taken advantage of? I came here after receiving a report that the Night Hound had appeared, but it was all in vain. Miss Uroboros shook her head as if she was tired. Night Hound are you saying you want to use me like this? Ho ho ho, you seem like such a cunning and charming person. It gets better and better, right? Soon, Miss Uroboros kicked off her seat, jumped into the air, and disappeared in the blink of an eye. Only thick dust and darkness are swallowing everything. And taking advantage of that opportunity, Bakir quickly entered the scene and caught a still-living louse. It was O.M., the leader of the Om religion. Off. He was horribly dismembered from the waist down by Miss Uroboros. Because he was half out of his mind, Bakir had to use Decoravia's abilities as well. He was mesmerized by the red light emanating from the single eye in the center of the inverted pentagram and spit out everything he knew before he died. Cog under the floor of the destroyed carriage hidden in three layers funding top secret document. Just before Miss Uroboros leaves and the Imperial Guard arrives. Vikir moved urgently. Quickly book the ledger. Then Dolores, who had been searching the carriage first at Vikir's gesture, shouted just as urgently. Here. I found it. Under the floor. Vikir and Dolores put the ledger in their arms and jumped into the dust. Now I've caught it past the tail and up to the body. Vikir thought. All that's left is the head. Just a real black scene. Vikir, carrying Dolores, looked at the ledger while gliding through the air on Madame Baby's thread. The answer Vikir was looking for. This was something that could be figured out even if you only glanced at the ledger for a few seconds. A name that accounts for an overwhelmingly large proportion of numerous transaction targets. 
an entity that was the source of funds for the Old Testament faction and used as a money laundering network for heretics and pseudo-believers. And this is where the Sixth Sisangshi is currently hiding. Episode 270, Rich Friend, 1. They were evil people who could never be forgiven. Dolores spoke while sitting on a water tank on the rooftop of an abandoned building with no one around. The sight of heretics and cults dying in droves was certainly a terrible sight. However, they were people who committed evil deeds in various places on the outskirts of the empire, beyond the eyes of the church. Fraudsters who took advantage of the hearts of sick patients and their families, or by scaring and intimidating them, used the wealth they had accumulated to lobby the central authority, and in return, they became more and more wealthy. In order to catch them all, there was no choice but to use a simple, drastic, but sure method. That was why Dolores cooperated with the Nighthound. And the result. Vikir, wearing the Nighthound mask, was able to find out the identity of the shadowy figure. An entity that not only raised and fostered local heretics and cults, but also used them to launder and distribute funds, eventually encroaching on about half of the religious hymns Quo Vadis. The end of that long loop. There was the name of the bourgeois conglomerate. Vikir handed over the ledger found at the scene of the massacre caused by Miss Uroboros to Dolores. Take a look if you can handle it. A voice without pitch. And the cold warning contained within. It was as if he was keeping a distance and drawing the line. But Dolores had already made up her mind. I will jump in with the hounds of the night, no matter what thorny path they take. Yet. Fluttering. Dolores opened the ledger without hesitation. W this. There was no need to look at the ledger closely. The word bourgeois, written in the transaction details was written on almost every page of the ledger, and the frequency of its appearance was overwhelming. Unbelievable. Oh my god. Dolores said in a trembling voice, as if she couldn't believe it. What the bourgeoisie was aiming for was clear. The intention is to weaken the power of Quo Vadis by growing pseudo-believers and heretics through donations, then split into the Old Testament faction and the New Testament faction, and then swallow up both groups at the same time, ultimately taking control of the entire religious in Quo Vadis. In other words, this is a silent great war taking place between the conglomerates, the religious families, and the seven major families of the empire. The fight between Morgue and Baskerville seems childish. Although not a single drop of blood was shed, the bloodshed and cruelty were beyond imagination. Vikir said, recalling Decarabia's testimony he heard earlier. This painting is probably a collaboration between the Nine Poems and the Sixth Poem. The Ninth Corpse, Dantalian, and the Sixth Corpse were said to be close friends. And at number six, I guess I plan to use this opportunity to finish the picture I was drawing with my close friend. They make donations to heretics and cults and use the money to purchase enormous amounts of indulgences to support the Old Testament faction. Heresies and cults are inherently secretive in their organizational system and have a lot of secrecy in terms of accounting and taxation, so it would have been good to use them as servants. The black money that was raised like that was laundered by purchasing indulgences and went into the Old Testament faction. Right. Since the sale of indulgences is a duty-free business authorized by the emperor, Quo Vadis would have had no reason to be suspicious or wary in the first place. Because I accepted the free sweet food without question, I became a fat and lazy pig. That would be the current Quo Vadis. Dolores blames herself. Vikir said briefly. It reminds me of the family motto of the bourgeois family. Yes. When Dolores raised her head with a puzzled expression, Bakir said a short word. There is no free lunch. This is the phrase that best summarizes capitalist society. Dolores swallowed heavily. The reason why the bourgeois family interferes with the Quo Vadis family is a question that can be answered without much thought. Trust. Faith. Faithfulness. Things that money can't buy. Wouldn't a society in which even such things can be purchased be a true golden omnipotent world? The sword of the Iron Blood Swordsman, the spear of the Chang He Chang family, the bow sword of the Shingumbi family, the Dokdo of the Guktokam family, and the magic sword of the Mago clan. I thought everything could be bought with money, but the faith of religious hymns could not be bought with money. Instead of consoling Dolores, who became sullen, Bakir said something different. 
Now that we have figured out the bourgeoisie's intentions, we must find the real evil beast hiding among them. Not all work is finished yet. An individual within a group. The real enemy within the bourgeois family must be found and eliminated. He's probably the sixth savior. At that time. Dolores asked in a slightly less confident voice. The last time I posted a 95-point rebuttal against the Old Testament faction, the Old Testament faction didn't even turn a snort this time we have to deal with the bourgeoisie beyond them. Is it possible? It's possible. Dolores' eyes widened as she saw Vikir answering her despondent question before she could finish it. Vikir spoke strongly and confidently. If only I had the strength. What should we do to attack an enemy who is armed with money, laws, and all kinds of systems and is protected by society? The answer is force. Only violence, only a powerful and cruel force that lurks quietly and secretly, can punish them. In the past, when the saint directly exposed the Indulgentia family's bribery corruption, it was shocking. At that time, even the bourgeoisie had not been caught. There is absolutely no chance of winning with regular methods. Vikir is thinking about various things in his mind. And Dolores' expression as she looked at Vikir's back was stiff with tension. Are you planning to assassinate key members of the bourgeois family this time? Yes. Vikir shared his assassination plan with others for the first time. This was because the memory of being forced to a higher level with the power of the buff in the Dantalian match was so strong. In times of crisis, it is always helpful. Although it seems that Dolores is still unable to control her arousal on her own accord, you never know. At that time, Dolores opened her mouth with a concerned expression. It is said that members of bourgeois families go to extraordinary lengths to avoid assassination. I think it's going to be quite tricky. Vikir nodded. A person with a lot to lose is bound to be fearful. Even in the world before Vikir's return, members of the bourgeoisie invested enormous amounts of money in security to prevent assassinations. In addition to personally trained private soldiers, he also hires mercenaries to protect his residence, exchanges, and stores. The way to work or home is also changed each time and travels secretly, and each time a person moves, the same carriage is divided into several vehicles. In addition, high-ranking members of bourgeois families spent enormous amounts of money on tutoring from childhood and received early training in various military techniques and magic, so each and every one of them was a talented person with a high level of inaction. Most members of bourgeois families live in luxurious mansions. There is an incredibly tight security and security system in place, and there are several layers of private soldiers and mercenaries surrounding it. Is it possible to sneak in? Dolores' doubts were legitimate. But Vikir shook his head and gave a different answer. If it's hard to find, you can make them come find it. Yes. How? In response to the question Dolores expressed, Vikir stroked his chin once. Then he asked a reverse question. Assassins must be versatile. So what do you think are the virtues required of an assassin? It was a difficult question for Dolores, who had never assassinated in her life, to answer. But she did her best to answer. Um. Well. Of course it's a murder technique, right? Also. Also health. Agility. Deliberation. Bent. Courage. Guts. And the ability to judge the situation immediately. And the reticence to not divulge information when caught. There is one more. Dolores tilts her head at Bakir's words. Finally, Bakir added one last thing. You have to make good money. Dolores had a blank expression for a moment. But Bakir continued speaking calmly. Sometimes you need money and prestige to get access to the assassination target. Even if we receive public funding, there are often cases where we have to raise expenses locally when the funding situation is limited or problems arise with the funding method. So, an unexpected item required of an assassin is the ability to make money. Reality is different from novels and comics, as there are extremely few cases in which ample military funds are included in assassinations. Even more so when dealing with an unspecified number of people with high social status. Vikir said. The reason why you need to make good money is simple. This is because lunch or dinner with high-ranking bourgeois executives are often put up for auction. Really? 
Do I have to pay for lunch? You have to pay a huge amount of money for that too. This is money that a typical office worker cannot earn even if he works his whole life. In this way, by sharing a meal together, buyers can obtain information about investments, personal connections, and future information. For example, the price of lunch with the bourgeois family's second son, Damien, was 100 kilograms of gold bars. Hi. Dolores swallowed the wind. Isn't that money enough to build a few more temples in the slums? It was a shocking amount for a New Testament saint who was always short on funds. Vikir spoke as if comforting Dolores, who was cowering without knowing why. Do not worry. Because I have a lot of money. To the extent that the bourgeois family contacted us first. Yes. Really? Dolores looked surprised and looked away. Without realizing it, she was looking up and down the night hound. Eventually, Dolores carefully expressed her opinion. But you look poor. The reason Dolores says this is because she once saw the night hound taking out all the money in its pockets and distributing it to the poor when the plague called Red Death was spreading. After hearing Dolores' words, Bakir paused for a moment and then changed his words. I'll correct it. For me. After a bit of silence, Bakir said something quite nice. I have a rich friend.